Welcome to RRI. To me, I see a lot of students who have come uh, who uh, haven't seen at RRI, so I'm presuming we are reaching out to a larger, uh, uh, you know, body of students, and I'm glad to see that we in RRI would like to do that. And the way we are reaching out are through these new event series that we are starting. So today I'm very glad to announce that we are starting this series of uh, pedagogical lectures. I mean, these will be uh, a set of lectures given by eminent people who are, you know, may not give an entire course, but cover some important topics. And uh, these, I hope, will be held fairly uh, frequently. So we have named it Vigyan Patshala. So welcome to the first Vigyan Patshala. And I'm absolutely delighted that uh, we are starting this off with one of the best known uh, lectures in astrophysics that I'm aware of uh, in my own experience, as well as I'm sure many of uh, the people here would uh, agree with me. So we have Professor G. Srinivasan, who uh, was a uh, faculty here uh, for many years created a very strong group on the, you know, astrophysics of compact objects. And, uh, you know, what I remember from my own student days as a graduate student is how beautifully he used to explain things. I have been like a color I didn't, I wasn't his student, but, you know, I was happened to be visiting and I would watch uh, him teach on the other board uh, with students. and. Of course, uh, the greatest thing for anyone is to see the kind of students he has produced uh, with the kind of mastery of astrophysics that they show and where I have interacted directly with them. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Biman to uh, formally introduce uh, Professor G. Srinivasan. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tarun. Um, Professor Srinivasan shouldn't uh, need an introduction in RRI, but uh, for the benefit of those who haven't seen him for, because uh, he hasn't given a lecture, live lecture for a long time here. Uh, so there's just a formal introduction. So Professor Srinivasan did his uh, master's degree from uh, the Bandaras University uh, in 1964. After that, he worked for a year in Madurai uh, American College. And then he uh, went to do his PhD in Chicago University, which uh, was full of luminaries at that time. Uh, and did his PhD in uh, condensed matter physics. Then uh, after his PhD, he went to uh, IBM Research Laboratory in Zurich, then to Chalmers in, uh, in Sweden, then to Cavendish uh, Laboratory in, in, in Cambridge, and then came to RRI. And uh, I probably won't be exaggerating if I were to say that, you know, he was one of the principal architects uh, of RRI in the beginning phase, if I use the word architect in more than one sense of the word. Um, and, and here he switched his interests from condensed matter physics to astrophysics, and he made a number of seminal uh, contributions to the topics of uh, neutron star physics, supernova remnants, and interstellar medium in general. I remember when I was a graduate student uh, somewhere else, and I, uh, my advisor uh, 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 told me about um, uh, a new idea of looking at the neutron star uh, interiors that had shaken up the world at that time. And I remember attending his plenary lecture in Texas Symposium in 1991. Uh, and Srini uh, 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 has not only been a scientist um, and a teacher, but also uh, has shaped, uh, has been a very vocal member of the astronomical community of India and uh, internationally. He has been uh, the past president of the Division of Space and High Energy Astrophysics in the International Astronomical Union and the Astronomical Society of India and in the management board of Bini Institutes in India. And he served on the Council of Indian Academy of Sciences for nearly two decades. 
And I should also mention that I mean, when I say that he has been a vocal member, he has uh, initiated what we now uh, call the Decadal Vision of Astronomical Society of India, streamlined how uh, time allocation is done in giant meter wave radio telescopes. And I remember at least in one occasion when um, uh, sometimes, you know, we choose to keep silent about things, about uh, policies. And at least in one occasion, I remember it was only Professor Nalika and Professor Srinivasan who rose to the occasion. And uh, this was a policy which would have undermined astronomy as a science. Um, and as Tarun mentioned, he has been a legendary teacher for 50 years and then uh, and not in a teacher just in classroom, but he has trained the students, generations of students uh, outside the classroom how to uh, uh, give talks, how to take notes, how to become a scientist. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll agree at the end of the lecture what I mean. Um, and you may have seen some of his uh, uh, lectures in YouTube. Uh, I think uh, uh, nearly 80 of his lectures are there in YouTube. And he has been, after his retirement, he has, been, he has dedicated himself to teaching and uh, various public outreach activities. So the further ado, may I uh, introduce, uh, 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 invite Professor Srinivasan. So I don't need to use this, right? <clears throat> Good morning. The first thing I would like to say is that the first time I gave a lecture standing here was so long ago that almost 95% of you weren't born. It was 47 years ago. I had just come here from Cambridge University in England, and I gave two lectures. And the first one was on the great discovery that Stephen Hawking had just made. He was a very close friend of mine in Cambridge. So the first lecture that I gave here was on Hawking radiation from black holes. Um, one shouldn't begin a lecture with an apology but I'm afraid I have to, because when I chose this as the topic of these two lectures, I was not aware that the director had intended this to be a kickoff of a new series of pedagogical lectures aimed at primarily at students. Had I known that, I would have picked a different topic. So maybe I'll come back again at some other stage and give a different set of lectures. Uh, I say this because you may find, I'm now referring to the college students here, I'm very happy that you've come, but you may find some of this a bit strange. And that reminds me of what the founder of this institute is supposed to have said about how to structure a lecture. One third of the lecture should be understandable to everyone. And one third of the lecture only to some. And one third of the lecture should be challenging to everyone in the room. OK. So you may find, some of you may find the whole lecture somewhat challenging. I hope all of you have brought a notebook. And unfortunately, being limited time, I have to use slides. Because I, when I teach, I use blackboard and chalk, which I cannot do on an occasion like this. So do try to write as much as possible. I will show lots and lots of slides. But I have worked very hard to make the density content of each slide very minimal. There will be just one or two lines in each slide so that it is easy to absorb. I will also repeat things again and again and again till you get sick of it. Um, one, one of the greatest teachers that I 
have heard is Sir Lawrence Bragg, who along with his father got the Nobel Prize for discovering X-ray diffraction. And Sir Lawrence Bragg once gave a lecture on how to give a talk. And that lecture was so famous that a leading physics journal used to reproduce it every 10 years. They did that for about 70 years. And I still remember one sentence from Lawrence Bragg about how to assess whether your lecture has been successful. And he says, the next day, if you ask anyone in the room who was present, do you remember at least one sentence from that lecture, then your lecture has been successful. So I hope tomorrow you will remember at least a few sentences from this lecture. We have lots of time for questions. So do write down what is not clear, and I'll see what I can do to answer your questions towards the end. This, we are nearing the end of the Platinum Jubilee year of the Raman Institute. And so I thought in consultation with the director that it would not be inappropriate to, on this occasion, take a walk down memory lane and talk about some things that happened right here in this building downstairs from where you're sitting. So what I'm going to do is tell you a very old story, a story that is more than 40 years old. In fact, I first spoke about that in this room 45 years ago in July 1978. So the story is very old. It is a story about how a dead star, a dead pulsar, can be brought back to life from its graveyard. It is the story of what is known today as millisecond pulsars. Now, this is a very old story, and I should justify why, to so many young people, I am talking about a very old story. Although the story is more than 40 years old, maybe even 45 years old, it turns out it has very great contemporary interest. And I will give you at least three reasons why this story is of great current interest. First of all, what are millisecond pulsars? Millisecond pulsars are very rapidly spinning neutron stars. The first one to be discovered on the 2nd of November 1982 has a catalog number which is given over there. I first read about it in Deccan Herald front page, the newspaper. It said, star spinning 642 times a second. The period of rotation of the star has been measured to unprecedented accuracy, 0 0.00155780644888727 seconds, 17 decimal place accuracy. The reason why it has not been measured to 18 or 19 decimal place accuracy is that the standard of time, the second itself, is defined only up to 17 decimal places by atomic clocks. So one of the reasons why the millisecond pulsars are very important is that they serve as calibrators for atomic clocks which define our standard of time. But I shall not deal with it. I shall instead mention three other reasons. The first reason is there are very good reasons to believe that in the coming years, one should be able to detect directly gravitational radiation from millisecond pulsars. Any rotating body which has an ellipticity in the, in the if I cut the object in the equatorial plane, if it is a circle or if it is a circle, then you will not get any gravitational radiation from it. So if I have an oblate spheroid, like an idli, which is rotating, you will not get any gravitational radiation. But if I take a piece of chewing gum and stick it on the idli and spin the idli fast enough, it will emit gravitational radiation. Now you will see as the lecture progresses that millisecond pulsars are precisely such objects. 
they are very rapidly spinning spheroids, which may have small hillocks or mountains on them. So you expect gravitational radiation from them, whose luminosity will be proportional to the sixth power of the frequency of rotation. And since they are spinning at a period of millisecond, you expect the luminosity to be quite high. The second reason is the following. You might have read in the newspapers a few a month ago that an array of millisecond pulsars has been used as a detector of gravitational waves, gravitational waves of extremely low frequency, such as you would get when two supermassive black holes coalesce and merge into a single supermassive black hole. Recently, you would have read in the newspapers that there have been claims of the detection of nanohertz gravitational waves, gravitational waves whose frequency is 10 to the power minus 9 hertz. And the only way we now know how to detect it is by using an array of millisecond pulsars. If you have questions, at the question time, I can tell you how such an array is being used. The third possible reason why millisecond pulsars are of great interest today is that millisecond pulsars are a new population of gamma ray sources. And this became clear around the year 2010. The newly launched Fermi Gamma Ray Large Area Telescope launched by NASA has detected a very large number of millisecond pulsars. So these three reasons, plus the fact that this is, after all, the platinum jubilee of this institute, is justification enough to look back in our history to remind ourselves of the story that I'm going to tell you about now. First, let's go back to the year 1967, month of August, when every, a young student by name Jocelyn Bell was working in the lab where I used to work before I came here, but this was before my time there. She was all alone working there because all her friends were attending a party in some professor's house. And there she discovered on that night a star, a tiny little star, which was twinkling away. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. And then there was secrecy clamped on the discovery. So from August 1967 till February 1968, the world did not know about Jocelyn Bell's discovery. So when the paper finally appeared in Nature in February 1968, it was an absolute classic paper. The final sentence of the paper was that this little star had to be either a white dwarf star or a neutron star. They couldn't tell which one it was. Within two weeks after that, radio astronomers pointed the telescope to the center of the Crab Nebula, which is the debris of the explosion of the star that took place in the year 1054 AD, record, studied in great detail by the Chinese, Korean, and Japanese astronomers. Even the wandering tribes of Native American Indians in their grave drawings, surprisingly, no one in India seems to have seen this stellar explosion. When radio astronomers pointed the telescope at the center of this, they found a twinkling star. And that immediately resolved the issue. The discovery of a pulsar at the center of this nebula, spinning with a period of 33 milliseconds, could not be a white dwarf. It would break apart if it spun that fast. So that clinched the, uh, the hypothesis that pulsars must be rapidly rotating neutron stars. <clears throat> so let's go back to the year 1930. A young undergraduate BSc student studying in Presidency College in Madras, Subramanian Chandrasekhar, made a very remarkable discovery for which 53 years later he was to get the Nobel Prize. The discovery he made can be stated as follows. White dwarfs are cold stars as opposed to the sun, which is a hot star. The sun is at a temperature of 10 million degrees. White dwarf stars are very cold stars. They are not supported by heat. They are supported by quantum mechanical pressure of the electrons. 
Now, what Chandrasekhar showed was that if such stars are more massive than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, then such stars are not possible. They will collapse. At that time, one thought they will collapse to a point. Two years after Chandrasekhar made this discovery, the neutron was discovered by one of Rutherford's students, Chadwick. And two years later, in California, Barda and Zwicky, two astronomers, hypothesized a new kind of stars, new kind of stars which consists essentially of neutrons, almost 100% neutrons. And they advanced the atrocious idea in this paper that supernovae represent the transition of ordinary stars into neutron stars. They did not explain why such a transition should occur and why, if it did occur, a star will become a neutron star. Because the necessary physics for that, the theory of beta decay, had not yet been invented by Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi invented the theory only the following year. So to me, it is still a surprise why Bade and Zwicky made this extraordinary statement. But a more solid foundation for neutron stars came in a short paper published in 1937 by the great Russian theoretical physicist Lev Landau, who showed how in a massive star, the center of the star could essentially become a ball of neutrons, or what we would today call as neutron stars. So what Jocelyn Bell had discovered in August 1967 was, in fact, a neutron star. So neutron stars had finally been discovered 38 years after Chandrasekhar's great discovery. Now, a crash course on pulsars, a literally a crash course lasting about two minutes, because that's all you need to know. Pulsars are strongly magnetized, rapidly rotating neutron stars. Their magnetic field strength is about 10 to the power 12 Gauss or 10 to the power 13 Gauss or 10 to the power 14 Gauss. And as you saw, the pulsar in the Crab Nebula is spinning once every 33 milliseconds. Suppose I have a metallic sphere, and it is uniformly magnetized. And if I spin it, surface charges will appear on it, like magic. And that is the first dynamo that Faraday made in Cambridge. And he called it a unipolar inductor. So if I connect any two points on the surface with a resistor, then you know, I'll find a voltage drop across the resistor because the surface charge density varies over the surface. If the, if, the, if the magnetic field is a dipole field, then the charge distribution will be a quadrupole charge distribution. Now, if this is not familiar to you, next time you ride a cycle and if it has a little dynamo, Please convince yourself this is what happens in a cycle dynamo. A little magnet is made to rotate by coupling it to the back wheel of the cycle. And because the magnet rotates, it generates a voltage large enough to light a bulb. And here it is. If I have a magnet which is 10 centimeters in diameter, and its magnetic field is about 10 to the power 4 Gauss, then I will generate a modest 5 volts, enough to light a little bulb. But if I have a neutron star whose radius is 10 to the power 6 centimeters, or 10 kilometers in size, then the voltage that I will generate, oops, sorry, the voltage I will generate will be 10 to the power 16 volts or 10 to the power 17 volts. Yes, you heard it right. If, if it is magnetized to 10 to the power 12 Gauss, and if I spin it only once every second, I will generate 10 to the power 16 volts. So the Crab pulsar, which is spinning at 33 milliseconds, must be generating 10 to the power 18 volts. So you can easily imagine, right on the surface of the neutron star, there will be a very strong electric field, because there is a potential drop of 10 to the power 16 or 10 to the power 18 electron volts. 
Now, the electrostatic force, small e multiplied by capital E, far exceeds any other force on any particle on the surface. It exceeds the gravitational force. It exceeds the nuclear force. Therefore, charges on the surface of a neutron star, electrons and protons and ions, will be pulled out of the surface and accelerated in the very strong electric field. And the electric field has a component also parallel to the magnetic field. These are magnetic field lines. I have only shown one field line in this particular slide. Because I want to make a very important point. Because the charges are pulled out of the surface and accelerated very quickly to almost the speed of light, there are relativistic electrons and protons. They would like to move outwards. But because there is a strong magnetic field, they will be forced to move along the magnetic field line. Because if they try to move across the magnetic field line, there will be a V cross B Lorentz force. And because B is so strong, the Lorentz force will be so enormous that the Lorentz force will prevent you from moving across the field. But there is no difficulty moving along a magnetic field line because the Lorentz force is zero along the magnetic field line. So what I want you to appreciate is that charges that are pulled out to the surface of a neutron star will be constrained to move like beads on a wire along the magnetic field lines. And as they accelerate, they will radiate because Maxwell taught us that an accelerating charge will emit electromagnetic radiation. What will be the nature of the radiation? If I have an electron going around in a circle, it will radiate dipole radiation. But if it is relativistic electron, the radiation will not be dipole radiation. It will not be monochromatic. And it will have other properties which are peculiar to relativistic charges. For example, radiation from a charge which is moving at a speed close to the speed of light will be beamed in the forward direction. You will only see the radiation if you are looking at it from the forward direction. The size of that cone is inversely as the Lorentz factor, gamma, which is 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. If you have studied some special relativity, you would have encountered that. So there will be a cone of radiation from relativistic particles. And this radiation will not be monochromatic. If the electron was moving at slow speed, then the radiation will be at the same frequency as the frequency at which it is going around. But if the electron is moving relativistically, all the harmonics of this frequency will be present. So you will have a continuum of radiation. And the radiation will be linearly polarized. And the polarization will be confined to the plane of the orbit. What has all these things got to do from Griffith's book or Jackson's book, whatever book you read, what has all this got to do with pulsars? The reason is very simple. If I have a very strongly magnetized star and the charges are pulled out of the surface, they will be forced to move along the field lines and they will radiate along the field lines in a narrow cone. So the most important thing I have said so far is that the radiation from neutron stars emanating from very close to the surface will be in a narrow cone. This idea was developed at Caltech in California. Almost on the other side of the Earth, in Sydney, Australia, V. Radhakrishnan, who used to be the director of this institute when I worked here, and his associate Cook, working in Sydney, made the same discovery, but without any regard for theoretical physics. They didn't know anything about relativistic electrons, synchrotron radiation, and all that. But they were very clever radio astronomers. What they measured was the polarization of the radiation inside a pulse. A very, very beautiful observation and an even more beautiful theoretical conclusion. And they concluded from this that the radiation from the neutron star will be 
from the magnetic poles, North Pole and South Pole, it will be in a narrow cone. And therefore, like a lighthouse, when the neutron star rotates, if the magnetic axis is not aligned with the spin axis, you will see one flash of radiation every rotation. And that is the twinkle, twinkle little star that Jocelyn Bell had detected in 1967. So till today, this is the model of pulsars. So that's the end of the crash course on pulsars. Now I want to begin with, well, one more thing. Pulsars emit electromagnetic radiation. The radiation carries away energy and angular momentum. That has to come from somewhere. It comes from the stored rotational energy and the stored angular momentum I omega. Therefore, a neutron star that emits radiation will slow down. Its spin period will lengthen. Its spin period will lengthen, and therefore, if I start out with pulsars here, spinning very rapidly, this is the logarithm of the magnetic field. This is the logarithm of the rotation period. You will see this diagram again and again and again. So please remember, this is the log of the magnetic field versus the log of the rotation period. So what you'll find, a pulsar slowing down, its period will lengthen. It will lengthen, but a little less rapidly. It will lengthen even less rapidly. But if it's a pulsar with a smaller magnetic field, its period will lengthen even slower, but it will certainly lengthen. The reason for this different behavior between the red arrows and the magenta arrows is that formula over there. What that formula tells you is the rate at which the rotation period lengthens because the pulsar is losing angular momentum, which is coming at the expense of the stored angular momentum. There are seats in the front, please. It's reserved for you only. Then the period derivative is proportional to the square of the magnetic field and inversely proportional to the period. Stronger the magnetic field, more rapidly it will slow down. Faster it is spinning because it's in the denominator, more rapidly it will slow down. One last thing. If you look at the pulsar, there are some 2,500 pulsars plotted here. You notice there are hardly any pulsars to the right of this line, which I've called as a death line. And the reason for that is, the reason why you don't find any pulsars to the right of that line, it is not a line that I have drawn with my eye. It is a theoretically predicted line. And the reason is the following. The radio radiation from pulsars emanates from a large number of electron-positron pairs that are created near the surface of the pulsar. You would have read in your modern physics course that a photon in the presence of a nucleus can decay to an electron and positron. It can also decay in the presence of a magnetic field to an electron and a positron. So a high energy photon created near the surface of a neutron star, because there is a strong magnetic field there, can create an electron and positron. They will radiate. They will create more electrons and positrons. So within a second, you create 10 to the power 46 electrons and 10 to the power 46 positrons. It is this that is responsible for the radio radiation from the pulsar. Now theory tells you that in order to generate electron-positron pair, the dynamo has to have a minimum critical voltage. So when the pulsar slows down and the dynamo weakens, it will switch off. So all, I, all you wanted to know is that pulsars die a natural death. They are still neutron stars. They are still spinning. They still have magnetic field. They only died as pulsars, in the sense they are no longer producing radio waves. They are not dead as neutron stars, okay? but they are dead as pulsars. So this region is the graveyard of pulsars. This is living pulsar. This is a dead pulsar. There are 2,500 pulsars over there. OK, now we'll begin our story. And 
I came to this institute in the beginning of 1976. Little before that, in 1974, Joe Taylor and his student Hulls discovered a remarkable pulsar. It was a pulsar in a binary system. For the first time, a pulsar had been discovered in a binary system. I learned most about this pulsar sitting right here like you are in this room because we used to have a lot of radio astronomer visitors to this institute, and they would all talk about this newly discovered pulsar. Now, in addition to being the first binary pulsar, at that time about 100 pulsars were known. But this was the first binary pulsar, pulsar with two stars in the system. It was a very odd pulsar. I will tell you why it was a very odd pulsar. Now, Hulse and Taylor were eventually awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1993. <clears throat> now, look at this picture and make it register in your mind because the story, entire story is about this pulsar. So there are two neutron stars in this system. One of them, the lighthouse is pointing towards us. This is the one that we see. This pulsar's lighthouse is pointing in some other direction. So some other astronomer living in some other star in our galaxy will see it, but we don't see it. It's not pointing in our direction. So that's the pulsar that we are going to talk about. Now, the mass of both these pulsars were measured, neutron stars were measured, <coughs> to remarkable accuracy. No mass had ever been measured in the history of astronomy to three decimal places. Not only they were able to measure the mass of this neutron star to three decimal places, they were able to measure the mass of that neutron star also to three decimal places. There's a fraud here. You don't see the other guy. So write it down in your notebook. How do we know? The other star that we don't see is a neutron star. And how do we determine its mass? And all you need to know is pre-university physics and Kepler's laws. Nothing more than that, OK? And then you will discover that Kepler's laws alone won't get you anywhere. And how do we know their masses? So this is the first problem for you, OK? All right. So if a clock is moving around in a circle where I'm pointing, you will find that the tick, tick, tick will suffer Doppler shift because it's coming towards you, blue shifted, red shifted, blue shifted, red shifted, and you will see a sinusoidal curve. But this is what you see. You don't see a sinusoidal curve you see a sine wave or a cos wave rich in harmonics. What this tells you is that the orbit is not circular. It tells you the orbit is highly elliptical. It's a highly eccentric orbit. The orbit has an eccentricity of almost 0 0.7, if my memory serves me right. OK? So convince yourself that you can actually measure the eccentricity of the orbit just from such a plot. What is plotted here is the rate of ticking in the y-axis as a function of the phase. So it's not a sine wave, but it is rich in harmonic. So by doing Fourier analysis of that, you can calculate the eccentricity of the orbit. Convince yourself how to do it. Okay? So those of you who are studying in MSc, in Christ or St. Joseph, go to Goldstein's book on classical mechanics with its help figure out how they deduce the eccentricity. Now, this pulsar was used to verify several predictions of general relativity to remarkable precision. Till then, the only test of general relativity was done with solar system, sending out light signals from here to Mercury and getting it back to Venus, getting it back to measuring the precession of the periostron of Mercury's orbit and so on. Those were not very good measurements. 
They were good enough to tell us that general relativity is on the right track, but they were not good enough beyond that. And this pulsar enabled us to measure things to an accuracy of better than 1%. Not only that, it gave the first measurement for the existence of gravitational radiation. The moon is going around the Earth. According to general relativity, the moon must be emitting gravitational waves. Where is the energy coming from? The energy and angular momentum has to come from the orbital energy and orbital angular momentum of the moon. Therefore, the moon will spiral into the Earth, just as J.J. Thomson's electron in the atom had to come spiraling inward. And Hulls and Taylor detected the lengthening of the period orbital, shortening of the orbital period due to spiraling in of the pulsar, due to emission of gravitational radiation. And once that figure was there, they had to be awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. Okay, this is the first demonstration of the existence of gravitational radiation. Now, let me go a little further into the story. Here is a plot that I made in July 1978 for a talk that I gave in this auditorium. There were about 72 pulsars inside that island. And this is the binary pulsar. This is the log, log plot. Log of the magnetic field plotted against the logarithm of the rotation period. So it sticks out like a sore thumb standing way outside the island of Pulsar. So here was the puzzle that speaker after speaker spoke about in this auditorium. It's a very strange Pulsar. It was spinning very, very fast, 59 millisecond period. That suggested the crab Pulsar is spinning 33 milliseconds. So it's only 1,000 years old. So if it is spinning at a period of 59 milliseconds, it must be a few thousand years old. Very good. You don't get any prizes for that. Except this is the first pulsar whose magnetic field was not 10 to the power 13 or 10 to the power 14 Gauss, but it was only 10 to the power 10 Gauss. And that suggested that maybe it is a very old pulsar whose magnetic field had magically decayed. So which is it? Is it young or is it old? Is it young or is it old? There's a third possibility. The third possibility is neither of them. It is just a cu curious coincidence. Well, there are 72 pulsars. Why can't there be an odd pulsar? OK, the good book says God created the heaven and the earth. Maybe he made a pulsar with a low field spinning fast. Possibility, right? Ah, but here is the catch. Then there is another coincidence. How come this is the only pulsar which is in a binary? Is there some connection between the fact that this pulsar is in a binary and this peculiar combination of characteristic of young and old? And that's what attracted me to astrophysics. So I was working on completely different area of physics at that time. And after hearing speaker after speaker, and they all said nobody had any clue about it, I decided, look, why don't I think about it? So the origin and evolution of this pulsar was the trigger for me to change over from condensed matter to astrophysics, in which I had no formal training whatsoever. But you always need an inspiration when you're trying to do something like this crazy thing, switching field. My inspiration was Miss Marple. I don't know if, how, how many of you heard of Miss Marple? Nobody has, one person has heard of Miss Marple. So that tells you how ancient I am, <laughs> OK? Miss Marple is a detective in Agatha Christie's detective stories. There were two famous detectives. One was Hercule Poirot, a Belgian. Please switch off your mobile phone. Something is oscillating, I can hear. I can't tell from where its oscillations are coming from. And Miss Marple is the other detective. 
And the reason why Ms. Marple was an inspiration for me is the following. Ms. Marple once said, any evidence is always worth noticing. You can throw it away later if it is only a coincidence. So maybe God made this odd pulsar. Maybe it's a coincidence. But just keep it in the back of your mind. And don't treat it as a coincidence. See if you can get somewhere. So that was my inspiration to jump from solid state physics to um, astronomy. So here are the two odd properties that I've already mentioned. Is it just a curious coincidence? An odd pulsar born with a very low field? But then there would be another coincidence. If there is another coincidence, Miss Marple would have been very unhappy. She was very smart. She lived in a small village, always knitting some sweater. But she knew every gossip that was going on in the village. And she was the person that Scotland Yard relied on to solve every murder mystery in those books. So in July 1978, I came up with a crazy idea, namely a pulsar which is dead and buried in the graveyard is somehow brought back to life. Now you remember Christ was crucified on Good Friday, and on Easter Sunday, two days later, he comes alive. So this is the same idea. And there's one more thing that you hear towards the end. So the idea was simply the following. You heard you have a dead pulsar over there where I'm pointing. Somehow, it was brought back to life. It, brought, it was brought back to life by spinning it up. Because as long as it is there, it cannot function as a pulsar. But if you spin it up and move it left on the period of rotation axis, then it will start functioning once again as a pulsar. So this was the idea. So. So there is a pulsar, newly born. Its period is lengthening, lengthening. Dynamo is getting weaker. Finally, it dies because it crosses the death line. And then it is spun back into life. So such born again pulsars, we gave it a name in this institute. We called it recycle pulsars. Recycle pulsars meaning its magnetic field has changed. Its period of rotation has changed. Its characteristics have changed. Now to make, uh, to recycle a pulsar, to bring it back to life from its graveyard, as a weak magnetic field neutron star spinning very fast, two things must happen. One, the magnetic field must decay from 10 to the power 14 Gauss or 10 to the power 13 Gauss many orders of magnitude. The second thing is, you have to spin it up from a period of many seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, to 1.5 milliseconds or 59 milliseconds. So you've got to be able to do two things. So in the next, the remaining time in this lecture, in the afternoon's lecture, I'm going to tell you how to do, do these two things. What is the purpose of it if it's all been done and <clears throat> understood? The reason is there's some beautiful physics along the way. So my objective is to tell you about the physics. There will be hardly any astronomy in what I'm talking about. The physics may be familiar to you. If it's not familiar to you, it, is excite it should be exciting enough for you to go back and learn about it. Okay. Now first, let us take up this problem, uh, how do I spin up a neutron star? They're heavy objects, huh? they weigh as much as the sun. Now, let's go back to some basic classical mechanics. This problem was first studied by Euler, one of the greatest mathematicians ever, and then by Lagrange, of Lagrangian mechanics. What is plotted here are gravitational equipotential lines of a binary system consisting of one star there and one star there. This could be the sun. This could be the earth, for example. You will agree that near each star, 
the gravitational equipotentials will be spheres just from symmetry because gravitational force is a central force here also. But if I come to this point L1, which is called the Lagrangian point 1, L for Mr. Lagrange, then a test particle has a dilemma. The gravitational force acting at that point due to the sun and due to the earth are numerically the same. Of course, you will be much closer to the earth and much farther from the sun because the sun is more massive. If the two objects are of the same mass, it will be halfway point. It can be anywhere, OK? So that is why these equipotentials beyond that radius are no longer circles. They intersect there. And the equipotential beyond that are like molecular orbitals in a hydrogen molecule. When two hydrogen atoms are far away, the electrons are in circular orbits. When I bring the two protons close together, a molecule forms, as Heitler and London first calculator, and then Heisenberg, the electron orbits around both the nuclei. So that's the significance of these equipotential lines. The Aditya satellite, which was launched by ISRO a month or so ago, will go and sit at this point, the inner Lagrangian point L1. This is the Earth, this is the Sun, so that it can look at the Sun without being eclipsed by the Earth. The James Webb Telescope, about which you would have read in the newspapers, is an infrared telescope. It doesn't like sunlight, so it is parked over there on the backside of the Earth, where the sun is forever blocked, so that the telescope doesn't get heated and radiate infrared radiation far in excess of the cosmic infrared radiation. But we are not talking of the Earth-Sun system. We are talking of two stars, which were the parents of the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. Now I want you to concentrate on this dark equipotential, which is intersecting. That has a name that is called Roche lobe. Mr. Roche, one of the great mathematicians of the 19th century, studied this in great detail. So here is, a, for example, a compact star maybe a neutron star, maybe here is a star like the sun. And this is the gravitational equipotential which is intersecting that point L1. That is called the Roche lobe. What is the significance of the Roche lobe? As the stars age, their sizes change. Someday the sun will become a giant. If you look up in the sky, you will see some stars are red. Those are already giants. 300 times the size of the sun. The sun itself is a very compact star, only a million kilometers in radius. Someday the sun will also become a giant. So when the star becomes a giant, it will become as big as its Roche low. OK? Now the Roche low is determined by just mechanics. They are gravitational equipotential lines. The evolution of the star has to do with what's happening at the center of the star. So a gaseous star evolves. The sun is not evolving now. The sun is in a very quiescent phase. It is converting hydrogen to helium. It will do so for 95% of its life. Then it will convert helium to carbon, <clears throat> then the carbon to neon, magnesium, and so on. And if the star is massive enough, it will go all the way and it will explode. When the star develops a carbon core, it will contract. And when the carbon core contracts, the gravitational binding energy release will make the star become a giant. So that is how stars become a giant. So all I want to do, I don't expect you to have understood what I said. I only want you to remember the following statement. Stars are doing its own thing. During the course of its life, they will become bigger and bigger and bigger. But a star cannot become bigger than its Roche lobe. If it is an isolated star, like Betelgeuse, it can become as big as it wants. But if it is a companion, then it cannot become bigger than this size. 
because if it becomes bigger than this size, then the matter will flow to the companion star through this inner Lagrangian point L1. So mass will be transferred from the giant star to the compact star. So that is how we are going to spin it up, OK? Because when matter comes from one star to another star, it is bringing in orbital angular momentum. And it is that orbital angular momentum which I'm going to use to spin up the central compact star. Now, what I want you to remember is this one sentence. No star can become larger than its Roche lobe if it is a member of a binary system. If it is not a member of the binary system, forget everything that I said. It can become as large as the universe. There is no, no bar on that. But if it's a member of the binary system, it cannot become bigger than that. It will transfer mass to the companion. So it's like having a toothpaste tube. The toothpaste tube is your Roche lobe. If the toothpaste expands, it cannot expand the toothpaste tube. It will have to come out. Okay, So that's the concept of mass transfer in a binary system. So let me tell you characteristic. Smaller the mass, smaller is the Roche lobe. Because if, the, if, if it's a small mass, then if I go further and further out, the influence of the other star will be more than the influence of the parent star itself. So it's no longer, the equipotential is no longer a sphere. Similarly, if the distance between the stars is very large, if the two hydrogen nuclei are very far apart, then the orbits will be circular, not only for 1s, 2s, 2p, 3p, 4s, all orbits were circular. There's no question of overlapping of orbits. So please think about it. Now here is a, so when a, when a star fills its Roche lobe, the matter will not rush to the other star because the matter has angular momentum. Why is it angular momentum? The two stars are going around a common center of mass. Therefore, any test particle that leaves the companion star has orbital angular momentum. So when it comes to the other star, it will form a disk like the rings of Saturn. It will form what is called as an accretion disk. So matter will eventually fall onto the neutron star, not radially from the companion star. It will form an accretion disk, and it will spiral in the accretion disk, and eventually fall onto the neutron star, transferring mass as well as transferring angular momentum to the neutron star. Now, here is a problem for you, second problem. Write it down. Let us say this star is going to become a giant and transfers mass to this star. And let us say this star is more massive than this star. The donor star is more massive than the receiving star. Then convince yourself that the orbit will shrink. This is 10th standard physics problem. You should be able to do it in two minutes, okay, sitting by yourself. Huh? So if the more massive star transfers a mass to a less massive star, orbit will shrink. The reverse will be the case when a less massive star transfers mass to the more massive star, then the orbit will expand. Verify this. It is a simple problem in Newton's laws. Okay. And you should not get more than two minutes to do this problem. If you're more ambitious, actually transfer a mass delta m and calculate how much will be the shrinkage of the orbit and how much will be the change in the period of the orbit. Okay, that would be not 10 standard, that would be a PUC problem. But you ought to be able to do that. Okay, now follow the story. Here again, Mr. Bill Gates playing his tricks. That's supposed to be sun, symbol for the sun, 25 solar mass, 10 solar mass. So I want you to look at this evolution of a binary consisting of a 25 solar mass star and a 10 solar mass star. Why? For reasons you don't bother, OK? They are interesting numbers. It could be 22 and 17. It could be 12 and 8. 
I just happen to like 25 and 10. Okay? Just follow the evolution of that. So there it is. Then next step, this more massive star will become a giant soon. And then it will transfer mass to the less massive star. The more massive star has transferred mass to the less massive star. Now this has become more massive. This has become the less massive star. This less massive star now is the helium core of the original star. The sun is 77% hydrogen, some 22% helium. What is in the center of the sun is helium, hydrogen being converted to helium, and primordial helium combined. And that will sooner or later evolve, explode, and leave behind a neutron star. So our story now has gone to act two, scene one. The first neutron star has been born in a binary system. The first neutron star has been born from the more massive star. Because according to the theory of stars, it is hotter in a more massive star. The nuclear fusion reaction takes place faster in a more massive star. Therefore, a more massive star will evolve faster than a less massive star. OK? All right. Now, here is the next part of the story. Now, let us let's go to the companion star. The companion star will also evolve in its own time scale. And there will be a wind from the companion star, just as there is a wind from the sun. One of my teachers in Chicago, Eugene Parker, discovered the solar wind. And you detect the solar wind on the Earth. Its velocity is about 400 kilometers per second in the, uh, outside of the Earth's atmosphere. And when matter falls onto the neutron star, the gravitational potential energy released will come out as X-rays. And this was predicted long before neutron stars were discovered by a great Russian theoretical physicist by name Zeldovich. He was a very great physicist who worked on almost everything under the sun and above the sun. Okay, he worked on fluid dynamics. He worked on the hydrogen bomb. And he worked on problems concerning cosmology, elementary particle physics, and everything you name it. And long before Pulsa, I mean, Jocelyn Bell discovered neutron star, he predicted that if matter were to fall onto a neutron star, it will emit X-rays. And that is how the first neutron star was discovered. At that time, one did not recognize it as a neutron star, like Jocelyn Bell did. Now, then finally, when the companion star evolves and becomes a giant, it will transfer mass to the neutron star, transfer angular momentum, and spin it up. So this is the phase that I'm interested in. The companion star becomes a giant, transfers mass back onto the neutron star. The angular momentum depositor on the neutron star will spin it up. There is a ceiling fan. If I have a series of cricket balls, and if I'm a good enough fielder and throw it at the blade of the fan, I could spin it up. I could also slow it down. If the cricket ball is expelled by the fan, the cricket ball will go with an angular momentum. I threw it radially at the fan with zero angular momentum. But it's flying off through the window with angular momentum. Where did that angular momentum come from? The fan will slow down. So the fan will either spin up or slow down, depending on how clever I am throwing my cricket balls at the fan. You will see the analogy here. A neutron star has a magnetic field. And the field lines are like the blades of a fan. The neutron star is spinning. Matter is coming in from a companion. The matter is charged. Charges don't like magnetic field, V cross V force. So the neutron star can either be slowed down or can be spun up. Both will happen. Okay. So you have to be a little bit clever on how to spin it up. 
So now let's take the story a little bit further. Now this companion star will also evolve and become a supernova explosion producing a neutron star. So you will have two neutron stars now in the binary system. Now two possibilities. One is the two neutron stars are bound in a binary system, like the hull Taylor binary pulsar, for which the Nobel Prize was given, or the two neutron stars will just say goodbye and fly away in opposite direction, conserving momentum and angular momentum. Which is more probable? Two runaway neutron stars are more probable. To keep two neutron stars intact requires a little bit of trick. So here is your fourth problem. This is the pre-university problem again. Consider two stars of mass M1 and M2. Doesn't matter what M1 and M2. Two stars of mass M1 and M2. M1 decides to explode and eject the mass delta M. It goes off in all directions. Newton's laws assume an M1 and M2 are going around in circular orbits. Forget Kepler, ellipse, and everything. Imagine they're going around in circular orbits. Imagine no angular momentum is lost from the system. It's just that M1 has just decided to eject a mass delta M. If there's an explosion, it ejects a mass delta M. Prove this little theorem. This will take you maybe three minutes. Show that the binary will be disrupted only if delta M is greater than one half the total mass of the binary system. Again, you don't have to assume any values for M1, M2, delta M. Call them M1, M2, and delta M. Using Newton's laws, prove that the binary will be disrupted only if the mass lost from the system is greater than one half the total initial mass. So what I'm saying is in the problem that we considered before, in 99% of the cases, the second, first explosion will not disrupt the binary. The second explosion, delta M, will be greater than M1 plus M2 divided by 2. Binary will be disrupted. So you need some fancy asymmetry to make the binary system bound. If the binary system, thank God, there are asymmetries, and in some cases the binary is bound. If the binary is not bound, Dr. Ayer will be very unhappy because he spent years of his life calculating gravitational radiation from binary neutron stars. And as you know, we have now detected a burst of gravitational radiation from many coalescing neutron star binaries. But they are rare. In majority of the cases, the binary will be disrupted. All right, now let's continue with the story. Now, when the neutron star is accreting matter from the companion, it will be spun up. The question is, this is the question that attracted me. What will be the period of rotation of the firstborn neutron star after the spin phase is over? No one had an answer to this. It is elementary consideration to say that if matter rained on the neutron star from a companion, it will bring it angular momentum, and therefore it will spin it up. You don't get a price for saying that. What will be its period at the end of the story? Nobody had an answer. And that, in my first foray into astrophysics, I was able to find a simple and yet a compelling answer. And that's what I want to tell you about now. The first statement is the following. A magnetized neutron star accreting from an accretion disk. I already told you matter will first form a disk and from the disk it will fall onto the neutron star. Now the statement is such a neutron star will attain an equilibrium period. That equilibrium period will be determined by the magnetic field and the accretion rate, the rate at which matter is falling in, grams per second. 
the rate at which matter is falling into the neutron star. Why? Let's look at this problem a little more carefully. Here is a polar view. Here is a view in the equatorial plane. This is the view from the pole of the neutron star. This is the accretion disk. You notice that the inner edge of the accretion disk is not touching the neutron star. If you have seen photographs of Saturn, the rings of Saturn are not touching the surface of Saturn. They are out at a certain distance. Similarly, the accretion disk will not touch the surface of the neutron star. Why? That is because in the magenta region, there is a magnetic field. Here is the neutron star, the dipole magnetic field is there. So when matter is coming in to fall into the neutron star, that matter will meet the magnetic field lines. And it will encounter V cross B force. Or it will experience Maxwell stress tension. Magnetic field exerts a pressure, B squared over 8 pi, which is the energy density of the magnetic field. So, so the magnetic field prevents the accretion disk from touching the surface of the star. And the inner edge of the accretion disk has a radius or a radial distance from the center of the neutron star, and that radius is known as the Alpine radius, named after a famous Swedish plasma physicist. He didn't work on this problem, but he worked on plasma physics. And he was the first person to really appreciate the role of the magnetic field in the dynamics of the mag of, 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 of plasma. So the alpha n radius, the radius at which the accretion disk is stopped by the magnetic field, stop, is the radius at which the magnetic pressure precisely balances the ramp pressure of the infalling matter. Remember, the matter in the accretion disk is spiraling in. It has a certain velocity. Therefore, it is exerting some momentum and pressure. So when these two pressures matches, magnetic field will say, stop. Now, the alpha n radius, to repeat again, is determined by the condition the magnetic pressure is balanced by the ramp, ramp pressure. The magnetic pressure is b squared over 8 pi. And the ramp pressure is rho v squared. Now, this is a little more involved. It will probably take you an hour to do it. But it's still a first year BSc level problem. Because I've told you what the two formula are. Magnetic field depends on the distance. Dipole magnetic field decreases as 1 over r cube. The density of matter is also changing with distance. Gauss's theorem, everything that is crossing a sphere is crossing the next sphere, next sphere, so you can calculate how the density profile is as a function of the distance. So you can calculate the two pressures and convince yourself. Oh, oh, just a minute. So here is Mr. Professor Alfred getting the Nobel Prize for the King of Sweden in 1970 for his work on plasma physics. He did not work in astrophysics. But he played a very important role in understanding the role of the sun's magnetic field in the dynamics of the corona of the magnetic field. So his Nobel Prize was related to that. So let's continue with the story. The equilibrium period of the star, as I told you, is where the magnetic pressure balances the ramp pressure. So if you do, if you equate the two pressure, if you equate b squared over 8 pi to rho v squared and solve for the radius or the period, you get this. It's a very simple thing. Now there are all these constants, the radius of the star, the mass of the star, and so on. Those are all given quantities. The only two things that are of importance is the magnetic field of the neutron star and the rate of accretion m dot of the neutron star. So I will rewrite that formula. And over there, so the period of rotation of the neutron star will be b to the power 6 over 7, almost b to the power 1, 
m dot to the power minus 3 over 7. Where do all these crazy powers come from? It's just by equating b squared over 8 pi to rho b squared. You just work it out, all these things drop out. There is no, I've not done anything fancy at all. In fact, I cannot do anything fancy. These are calculations that even I could do, so you ought to be able to do it. OK, so the equilibrium, of what is the meaning, physical meaning of the equilibrium period? Imagine this is the Earth, rotating Earth. Imagine that at this radius, there is a communication satellite, insight satellite, whose period of rotation is the same as the period of rotation of the Earth. That's why it's a geostationary satellite. You can't make insight go around the Earth at that radius. It will fly off because centrifugal force will be larger than gravity. You can't make insight go around the Earth at that radius, with the same period as uh, period of rotation of the Earth, because then gravity will be stronger than centrifugal force, it will fall into the Earth. You can make insight go around the Earth with the same period as the Earth at only this radius, where the centrifugal force precisely balances the gravitational force and the period of rotation is the same as the period of rotation of the Earth. OK? Now, insight cannot control the rotation of the Earth. The Earth will say goodbye to insight if it is at the wrong radius. But insight can't tell the Earth, look, you change your rotation period to match with my rotation period. But now we are not dealing with insight. We are talking about matter that is coming from the companion star, which has enormous angular momentum. Remember, the orbital angular momentum is determined by the lever arm. The lever arm is the distance between the two stars, which is enormous compared to 10 kilometers, which is the size of a neutron star. Neutron star is smaller than Bangalore. So the angular momentum of the incoming matter is astronomical compared to the angular momentum of the spinning neutron star. So the incoming matter doesn't care whether the fan is going around in the same direction or in the opposite direction. It will best spin it around. OK? So what I'm saying here is, is that the star will adjust its period of rotation such that it is equal to the Keplerian period at the inner edge of the accretion disk, where the matter has been arrested. So the matter is arrested, it's going around at what speed? At Keplerian speed, at Keplerian period. So the star will say, let me now adjust my period. Otherwise, what will happen to the star? It will either be spun up or be slowed down. It will not be in equilibrium. It may spin up, it may spin down, till finally, it will settle down to an equilibrium period where the period of rotation of the neutron star is precisely equal to the Keplerian period of rotation. So that is the physical meaning of that formula over there. So the Keplerian period of the neutron star is determined by only two quantities apart from fundamental constants, which are the dot, dot, dots. It is determined directly by the strength of the magnetic field. Stronger the magnetic field, larger is the distance at which the neutron star will say stop. Larger is the accretion rate, it will squeeze the magnetic field, and smaller will be the radius at which the magnetic field will say stop. So please remember the magnetic field comes in the, in the numerator of this formula, and the accretion rate comes in the denominator of this formula. So, going back to the story of spinning up a neutron star from the graveyard, so the idea was simply the following. My idea was that there is an equilibrium period line. Remember, this equation, P is equal to B to the power 6 over 7 m dot, 
If I take a logarithm of the left hand side and the logarithm of the right hand side, log p will be proportional to b to the power 6 over 7, which is roughly b to the power 1. So it is a line of a slope approximately 1, slope of 6 over 7. The location of this line, whether the green line is there or there or there, depends on the value of m dot. There are no adjustable parameters whatsoever. Okay? There are absolutely no adjustable parameters. So this is the idea. The Hulstaler pulsar must be a recycled pulsar. Its period is what it is because for the magnetic field that it possessed when it was spun up, that's the period to which it would have been spun up. That would be the equilibrium period. Uh, but that's a nice story, except there is a catch. The catch is the following. That equilibrium period line is determined by two things, not only the strength of the magnetic field, but by the accretion rate. Therefore, that equilibrium period line could be the magenta line, or the green line, or the blue line, all parallel to one another, differing only in the value of m dot. Which one is it? Oh, can you tell uniquely sitting in this room, it has got to be only that line. Then you're home. Then you have solved this big problem. So the inspiration was, I was able to tell you, tell which is the critical line. So, so that's what uh, I've said there over there. Now look at the three question mark. Is it that line or that line or that line? And the answer is very simple. So one picture is worth 10,000 words. So let me show it again. Here is log magnetic field versus log period. And I'm spinning up a neutron star from the graveyard. So its period will shorten. I'm going to increase the accretion rate m dot. If I increase the accretion rate because it's in the denominator, the period will get shorter and shorter and shorter. So watch this. So greater the accretion rate, shorter the equilibrium period. Corresponding to that accretion rate, that's the equilibrium period line. If I increase the accretion rate, that will be the line and that will be the equilibrium period. If I increase the accretion rate further, that will be the equilibrium period line and that will be the rotation period. Which one is it? So you ask the question. Similarly, smaller the magnetic field, shorter the equilibrium period. P is proportional to B. So if the, if the magnetic field of a star is that, it will be spun down, spun up to that period. If the magnetic field of the star is smaller, it will be spun up to even shorter period. So c come on, you have to be able to say something definite. Otherwise, you haven't answered any question. So the question is, for a given magnetic field, the Hull-Steller pulsar magnetic field has been determined. It is 10 to the power 10 Gauss. Can you tell me to what period it would have been spun up without any apologies, without any adjustable parameters? So is it going to be that, or that, or that, or that is the question. Is there a minimum period? The answer is yes. The answer was given to us long time ago by Sir Arthur Eddington in his book on the internal constitution of stars written in 1923, which I remember teaching to the joint astronomy program students when I was learning astronomy. I had to teach myself astronomy. And the way I did it was every year I taught a different course and joined the astronomy program. So let's remember what Eddington said in his book. Here is a star like the sun. It's extending way beyond this room. Let us construct an imaginary sphere of radius small r inside the star. And let's consider a unit volume on the surface of that sphere. Let's assume the star is made entirely of hydrogen. They're not bothered with a lot of chemistry there. So let's consider a unit volume which consists of n electrons and n protons. Don't worry about helium and all that. Irrelevant details. Now, 
let L be the luminosity of the star generated at the center due to nuclear fusion reaction. I don't care what generates the energy. When Eddington wrote his book, nobody knew. Only Eddington knew. And nobody in the world believed him. And it took 100 years before it was proved. OK, that is the story of the missing solar neutrinos. But doesn't matter. Let L be the luminosity of the star. So many eggs per second produced at the center. That luminosity is escaping radially in all directions. What will be the pressure of radiation on that unit volume on the surface of a sphere whose, surface, whose radius is small r and whose surface area is 4 pi r squared? You've heard of radiation pressure, right? Stefan's law. OK, I'm just going to invo invoke Stefan's law. Now, the radiation pressure exerted per unit area of the sphere is L divided by 4 pi r squared times the speed of light. L is energy flux escaping in all directions. So per unit area of the sphere means I have to divide by 4 pi r squared. L is the energy flux, energy per unit time. Speed of light is distance divided by time. So time cancels out. Therefore, it is energy divided by distance. Energy divided by distance is force, because force multiplied by distance is work done, which is energy. So convince yourself from simple dimensional arguments that L divided by 4 pi r squared c is the pressure of radiation per unit area of the surface. But I'm not interested in unit area. I'm interested in this little unit volume, where there are n electrons and n protons. Each electron has a surface area, sigma. It has a certain cross-section. Each proton also has a certain cross-section. But protons are very heavy. Photons will not do much with protons. But photons can push electrons more easily. So we will only consider electrons. Because the force on the proton will be 2,000 times smaller. So we'll forget protons momentarily. The next slide will bring in photons and forget electrons. When we talk of gravity, because gravity is 2,000 times stronger for the proton than for the electron. OK? Therefore, the radiative force per unit volume is just L divided by 4 pi r squared c multiplied by the total area subtended by n electron. Each electron subtends an area sigma Thomson, which is the cross section. Right? It is not pi r squared, where r is the radius of the electron. It is larger than that. It was first calculated by J.J. Thomson and given the name Thomson scattering cross-section. What is the Thomson scattering cross-section? The Thomson scattering cross-section is 8 pi by 3 multiplied by the square of the classical radius of the electron. What is the classical radius of the electron? J. J. Thomson said the classical radius of the electron is that where the electrostatic energy E squared by R is equal to the rest mass energy of the electron. So that is the Thomson scattering cross-section. OK? So if you look at the sun, for example, the Thomson scattering cross-section is about half a centimeter. So if I'm inside the sun, I can't even see the tip of my nose. Because to see the tip of my nose, that photon from that light has to scatter off the tip of my nose and reach my eye. It won't reach my eye. It will only go half a centimeter before it's scattered off. OK? Even Superman cannot see. Because even in X-rays, the Thomson scattering cross-section is large enough. The mean free path is half a centimeter. OK, so now we are home. What is the gravitational force on the unit volume? Mr. Newton, forget electrons consider only protons. So the gravitational force is g, mass of the star interior to the radius small r, mass of that unit volume, 
which is the number of protons multiplied by the mass of the proton, add the mass of the electron if you want to be particular. And what Eddington said in his book of 1923 is that for radiative equilibrium, gravitational pressure is balanced by radiation pressure. In a star like the sun, gravitational pressure is balanced by pressure of the gas due to Boyle's law plus the pressure of radiation. But for more massive stars, Eddington said, forget about gas pressure, it is unimportant. It's only radiation pressure that is important. So we ignore electrons justifiably, and there it is. So the left-hand side is the gravitational force acting on that unit volume. The right-hand side is the radiation force, radiation pressure exerted on that unit volume. So there I can solve this equation for the luminosity. And that is shown in the next slide. The luminosity of the star is 4 pi C G M P divided by the Thomson scattering cross section multiplied by M. And this formula now has been given the name Eddington luminosity limit. Why? This is the maximum luminosity a star can have. And this maximum luminosity is determined solely by the mass of the star, apart from fundamental constants. You would think this is nonsense. If I take the sun, squeeze it, it will become hotter. So it should radiate more. Eddington said, no. You, can, you do what you like. You cannot get radiation more than this per unit time. Because if you did, radiation pressure will blow apart the star. It will become larger than gravitational pressure. So the star will be blown apart. OK? Now, E is equal to H nu. E is equal to mc squared. You agree these are two of the most beautiful formulae in physics. Apart from that, I know of two other formulae. One is this formula, and the other is the formula that Chandrasekhar derived for the maximum mass of a white dwarf. This one, that one is even more magical than this. That one is determined solely by fundamental constants. At least this one involves the mass of the star. So to me, this formula derived by Eddington in 1923, for the maximum possible luminosity any object could have, along with E equal to H nu, E is equal to MC squared, and Chandrasekhar limiting mass are two of the most beautiful formulae in all of physics that I am familiar with. Now that formula, I can put in all these constants and rewrite it as 10 to the power 38 x per second multiplied by M divided by the mass of the sun. Where did the mass of the sun come from? All these constants I take from Clark table and I convert it to the mass of the sun, which is uh, 2 times 10 to the power 33 grams, or something like that. Look in Clark's table. OK? So sun cannot have a luminosity more than 10 to the power 38 eggs per second. It cannot. Sun's luminosity is only 10 to the power 33 eggs per second. But it cannot be more than that. But look at this. Suppose a star has a luminosity of 10 to the power 46 eggs per second. Such stars exist. Star-looking objects exist. They are called quasars. Their luminosity is 10 to the power 46 eggs per second. Now, I remember when quasars were discovered. I was a student at the time. Nobody knew what they were. But immediately, people knew it had to be an object whose mass is 10 to the power 8 or 10 to the power 9 solar mass. Before even knowing what it is, before even knowing what is the source of radiation, how could they say that? They said, I don't care what it is. I don't care how it is radiating. It cannot radiate more than 10 to the power 38 x per second per solar mass. So if it has to radiate 10 to the power 46 x, it must be more than 100 or 1,000 million solar masses. And then I remember a colloquium in Chicago when I was a student when a radio astronomer came and said, 
that the luminosity of this quasar is changing with time over a period of one year. Then they knew that the size of the object had to be less than one light travel time in a year. And so if you put that much mass and that much radius, it had to be a black hole. So that was the argument for why quasars and active galactic nuclei are powered by supermassive black holes. The argument came from Eddington luminosity limit. What has that got to do with the price of fish and my lecture today? I am walking in the heavy rain with an umbrella. The rain is falling on my umbrella, producing terrible sound. I am going to claim that it cannot rain more than a certain limit on my umbrella. Because if it did, the sound produced will have so much luminosity, it will prevent more raindrops from falling on my umbrella. I am going to give that argument. Because that's the argument I had when I was walking one day during lunch break behind this institute here over here. So consider a mass M. Drop it on a neutron star, like Zeldovich did in 1962. The potential energy release will be roughly 10% of the rest mass energy. The mass of the electron is 500 electron volts. 500 kilo electron volts, half an MeV. So 0.1 of that is 50 kilo electron volt. 50 kilo electron volt is X-ray, right? Kilo volt is X-ray. 50 kilo electron volt is sort of hard X-ray, medium hard X-ray. So if matter rains on the neutron star, the Gravitational potential energy, MGH, which is released, is not released as sound waves, but released as X-rays. The X-rays will have a certain luminosity, X per second. Each electron is releasing 10% of its rest mass energy. The electrons are falling at a rate, M dot, so many grams per second. So the luminosity is not mc squared, but m dot c squared. m dot is dm by dt. Eta is 10%. You can argue, is it 10% or 9% or 12%, but it's all about 10% for a, a neutron star. It is a little less efficient for a black hole, but neutron star is a hard surface. So the efficiency of converting gravitational potential energy is a little more for a neutron star than for a black hole, which has no hard surface. So the gravitational potential energy is this. So here it is now. The, it, the, just as there is an Eddington limit for the luminosity of an object, I argued that there must be an Eddington limit for the rate at which matter can fall onto the surface of a star. Because when matter falls onto the surface of a star, it emits X-rays in the case of a neutron star, and the X-rays will have a certain luminosity. And since L has a luminosity limit, M dot should have a luminosity limit. And that luminosity limit is 10 to the power 17 grams per second. What is 10 to the power 17 grams per second? It is one Mount Everest. So only, you can only drop matter on a neutron star equivalent or worth one Mount Everest per second. You cannot drop two Mount Everest or 10 Mount Everest. You can drop less, but not more. Because if you did, then the, the luminosity, the X-rays you produce, will prevent the matter from coming in. So I hope you have understood this argument, that the limit on the luminosity provides you with a limit on the rate of accretion onto the star. So now I have answered the question. Can I say something unique about the minimum period to which I can spin up a neutron star. So, okay. so a neutron star cannot accrete at a rate greater than one Mount Everest per second. Now since the Eddington luminosity limit defines an upper limit to the accretion rate, the limiting equilibrium period is determined uniquely by the magnetic field during the spin up. The period of equilibrium period which is the Keplerian period at the inner edge of the accretion disk, is defined by two quantities, 
the magnetic field of the star and for the accretion rate. Now I'm saying the accretion rate cannot exceed a certain limiting value, which is Mount Everest per second. And therefore, I get a formula for the minimum equilibrium period of a star, which is a simple, elegant formula. 1.9 millisecond, the magnetic field in units of 10 to the power 9 Gauss to the power 6 over 7. So if a star had a magnetic field of 10 to the power 9 Gauss, its minimum period will be 1.9 millisecond. There are no adjustable parameters in this theory. Zero adjustable parameters. Okay? So that's the beauty of it. So the statement is, as I increase the accretion rate, the equilibrium period line goes, goes on shifting till finally I reach a limiting value for the accretion rate. And that will give me the minimum period to which I can spin up a star. So the hull stellar pulsar must be a recycled pulsar. If so, it should be located close to the critical spin up line. This green line has no adjustable parameters now. It is a plot of log b versus log p. M dot I've taken a limiting value, which has been defined only by fundamental constant. And so that's where the hull stellar pulsar ought to be if this theory is any good. So let's look at the facts. That's where it is. So this is the data, and that's the location of the pulsar, and that is the critical equilibrium period line. So the proximity of the pulsar to the limiting equilibrium period line confirmed, at least to me, that the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar is a recycle pulsar. Now, just at that time, a very distinguished astrophysicist, one of the world's most distinguished astrophysicists from Amsterdam, Professor van den Huffel, was visiting us here. I told him about this, and he was terribly excited. So when he went back, those days there were no emails, no WhatsApp and all that. There was a, down at the reception, there was a telex machine. I don't know if any of you have heard of telex machine. It'll go tuck, 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 and a paper will print something out. So he sent me a message after going back to Amsterdam saying, where is the paper? I said, what paper? He said, you have to write it up. Now, you know, there is a problem. If you have to write a research paper, you must know something about the subject. You must have some gravy to uh, drop some masala and so on, right? I knew nothing about astronomy. I didn't know enough words to write a paper. So I asked him, will you be kind enough to write this paper with me? So he said, fine. So I went there in October 1978, and we wrote up the paper for reasons I won't go into now. That paper was sent to a journal. It was lost by the journal. and. The other person in Amsterdam didn't follow it up. So there was some delay, whatever it is. But anyway, it eventually got published. And, and we made a couple of very important predictions. I'll stop at that. And we, the prediction was that the Hulse Taylor pulsar is a recycle pulsar. At that time, the notion of a recycle pulsar was not there in astronomical literature. And nobody believed us. And nobody believed us for 25 years that this could be true. And that, you will see more of that in the afternoon. We said the pulsar that we see, there are two neutron stars. We see only one of them. We said this must be the first born of the two. And its field has decayed and it has been spun up. And this was the very first pulsar to be identified as a recycle pulsar. We made one other prediction. What about the second neutron star you didn't see? Maybe someday you'll see both. Maybe someday you'll see both. Can you say something about the other star? Yes, we said the other neutron star will be like all the other garden variety pulsars. It will have a high field, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 Gauss. It will have a long period of one second, two seconds, three seconds. So 
So we'll see in the afternoon what the real story is. Okay, so the, to summarize this, the first born neutron star in the binary system is a recycle pulsar. It's a low field, its field has decayed. How? That's the afternoon story. Why its period is short, that was the story up to now. And the second one will be just like any old pulsar, like the Crab pulsar or the Vela pulsar, like the other 2,500 pulsars we know. They'll just have high fields between 10 to the power 13 and 14 Gauss, maybe some little more. They'll have periods of the order of second or so, unless they are very, very young, like the Crab pulsar. So we'll pick up the story after lunch. Um, I, I, I had to go long after this in the morning's lecture. But when I realized that most of you are from college students, um, I'll tell you a story which is opposite of this. Many years ago, I attended a lecture by a famous astronomer, Indian Institute of Science. That was a 1972. And it was about the multi-mirror telescope. And it was a highbrow workshop that Professor Swaroop had organized. In the evening, there was a public lecture on some new telescope. And it was billed as a public lecture. But there was no public. The only people who went to us who were attending the school. So the speaker began saying, the, saying that the public is very familiar. And in the same way, you know, I only see public here. I don't see many RRI people here. So the moment I realized that, I changed the talk from third gear to first gear, which is why I have not progressed as much as I should have. But it doesn't matter. We will, if it's all right with you, reconvene at 2 o'clock and not 2.15. OK? Have a lunch so that we uh, continue uh, for some more time. Is that OK? That is all right with you, isn't it? Doesn't cause any problem. Yeah. So, you, you, if you have any immediate question, you can ask. But one possibility is, I will try to come in here by 1:30. So anybody who is here can come and ask questions. It doesn't matter. Everybody has to be there. If they are that curious, they will also have a fast lunch and come. So I don't want to eat into your lunch time now. Okay. So like me, you probably are hungry. So, but I leave it to Professor Raymond. Will you take one or two questions? Yeah, maybe he says is one or, one or two. Is there one or two present that you will forget? Or you can't eat otherwise? Or you can ask it during the lunch. Thank you, Shani, for the possibility. So, we reconvene, I don't know, 1.30 is that? No, no, no. I will, we will formally reconvene at 2. Okay, but anyone who comes before that, if you have questions, you come. I'll be here. We can have a chat. Okay. Come and join uh, lunch uh, the Astro Terrace, Terrace of the Astro Building. Uh, one of us will escort the students to the. You you'll turn off the projector, right? You will turn off the projector. This can be on, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, this can be on. Or... We can off it. Do you want to keep on? Um, no, the, I want to continue. No, no, no. We're off the projector. Off the no, but what I mean is the computer, this can no, be on. No, it will be on. No issue. Just one minute. I can hear you better. So in the first so in the first part of the lecture when you derive the um, spin the spin up period, you assume that the magnetic field is constant during the accretion process. Is that because the time scale is such that the magnetic field decay does not play a role? We will come to that question now. Okay. In a few minutes we will take up the question of magnetic. The quick answer to that is, <clears throat> this accretion 
is taking place on a time scale of 100,000 years. Whereas the decay time scale of the magnetic field will be hundreds of millions of years. Okay. So. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, that alphan radius that you mentioned, that is for system with magnetic fields, right? Uh, or a star with the magnetic field. Only then it's called alpha and radius. Uh, in case of black holes, there is innermost circular uh, ISCO radius. Like stable orbit, based on only gravitational consideration, they find that. So that has nothing to do with this. That, how, how does it compare with the uh, alpha and radius? It depends on... For black holes, do we con consider alpha and radius? See, the last stable or orbit, <coughs> first of all, in Newton's theory, there is no last stable orbit. Relativity says there has to be a last stable orbit, OK? <coughs> and black holes also have external magnetic field. And we know that plays a very important role in creating jets and so on, OK? But it's a question of numbers, which is the smaller of the two. So you have to read papers by Blanford and his collaborators over many, many years to get numbers for it. Because the concepts are completely different, right? Because the last table orbit comes from the concept of an effective potential. The effective potential in general relativity is very different from the effective potential in Newtonian mechanics, right? That's why there is the concept of uh, last table orbit. Okay, because in, in, in Newton's theory with the inverse square law, there is a uh, <clears throat> 1 over r square, and then there is a repulsive centrifugal potential, and it is the overlap of the two. But in relativity, because there is a deviation from 1 over r square, the effective potential is different. So don't confuse the two things. Okay, so in a real, what you're asking is in a real astrophysical situation, when matter is accreting onto the black hole. Um, I don't think this question is going to be that relevant there because people are not thinking of a black hole being spun up. Okay, the spin of the black hole is due to its, uh, it's there in its horoscope, right? It is it's, it's because the progenitor of the black hole was spinning, therefore it's a curved black hole. Nobody is suggesting that. But maybe there will be situations in the future where you could change the spin of the black hole externally. But that is going to be very complicated. It will have to involve something like a Penrose process. I don't know. I don't know. That's far from my field of understanding. So maybe we could come back to questions. So let me, <clears throat> yes, somebody had a present question? So you, you talked about the anomalous uh, magnetic field, the low magnetic field of one of the neutron stars there. How was it measured? <clears throat> I told you that uh, I wrote a formula that the period derivative of a neutron star is proportional to b squared over p, OK, apart from constants here. So observationally, you measure the period of rotation, and you measure the rate at which the period is changing. And then that formula gives you the derived magnetic field. For some pulsars like the Crab and Vela pulsar, which are young because the field is very large and the P is small, P dot is so large that you can measure the slowing down of the pulsar between morning and evening. Okay? Because in radio astronomers can measure frequencies very accurately. So it can be done. But it's not so easy for these objects we are going to discuss. <clears throat> so I'll continue. This is still morning's agenda, so I'll try to speed it up. <clears throat> so
So we started that story in 1978. So we come to the 2nd of November 1982, the discovery of the first millisecond pulsar. The first millisecond pulsar, as I said, I read about it in Deccan Herald front, front page, a little box, star spinning 642 times a second. It was discovered by Don Backer and et al, I should mention, Sri Kulkarni, Srinivas Kulkarni, because he first got initiated astronomy right here in this hall, and he built the <coughs> correlator, which was used to discover this pulsar. So how did we come to hear about it? I told you first from Deccan Herald. And then around <coughs> 12 o'clock in the afternoon, or mid-day, mid there was what is called an IAU telegram. Every day, we used to get telegrams, a real telegram. Later on, it will come by post as a postcard. They are called the International Astronomical Union telegrams, announcing to the world new discoveries. So that telegram said uh, that the pulsar has a period of 1.5 millisecond, and its magnetic field was 10 to the power 12 Gauss, just like the crab pulsar. That's what the telegram said. <clears throat> but it was a solitary pulsar. It was not a binary pulsar. It was alone. <clears throat> that evening, around 5 o'clock, there was a small party, tea party in the canteen, because somebody had just got his PhD or leaving, I forget what. And so there was a little party. And I still remember, like yesterday, it just didn't seem right to me, this, what you're seeing here. And the reason is the following. It's the case of the dog that did not bark. With a period of 1.5 millisecond and a magnetic field of 10 to the 12 Gauss, which is what the telegram said, there should have been a spectacular nebula surrounding the pulsar, like the crab nebula surrounding the crab pulsar. Now, the crab pulsar is a very luminous object. It radiates 10 to the power 38 Hertz per second, all the way from gamma rays to radio waves. And the source of that energy was a great mystery for 40 years. Till finally, an Italian physicist by name Franco Pacini, who was a great friend of um, astronomers here, made an extraordinary suggestion that if there was a neutron star at the center of the crab pulsar, and if it was spinning with a period of few milliseconds, and if it had a magnetic field of 10 to the power 12 Gauss, the luminosity of the electromagnetic radiation it will produce will be the source of energy for the Crab Nebula. Okay? So the Crab Nebula radiates because the energy comes from the pulsar. Therefore, there should be a nebula like this surrounding the millisecond pulsar. And that nebula should be 10,000 times more luminous than the Crab Nebula because the luminosity of radiation from a rotating magnet, the Rayleigh's formula, b squared omega to the power 4, or b squared divided by lambda to the power 4, Rayleigh's formula. So because this is spinning at a period of one millisecond, and the magnetic field is the same, the luminosity should be 10,000 times or 100,000 times more. So from that party, I telephoned Kavalu where Professor Prabhu was observing. Those days, it took three hours to book a trunk call to Kavalur. You couldn't just call, OK? I told Prabhu, look to see if there is any nebula around this coordinate. He said there was nothing. And then we had the Palomar charts in the library. I didn't know how to see the Palomar charts. So I called Professor C.R. Subramanya, who was at the TIFR Center in IASC. He said, come and take a look. There was nothing in optical, nothing in radio nothing in X-rays, nothing in gamma rays. So there was no nebulosity, which is strange. So that reminded me of the story of Silver Blaze. 
Okay, one person had heard of Agatha Christie. How many have read Sherlock Holmes? Few more. Okay, there is the story of the Silver Blaze, a racehorse which disappears. So the inspector there called Sherlock Holmes, who comes from London with Dr. Watson, to look around, going around with magnifying glass. And then Sherlock Holmes says, let's go back to London. So Inspector Gregory is very intrigued. So he says, Mr. Holmes, is there anything else you wish to draw my attention to? Holmes says, the curious incidents of the dog that night. The inspector said, the dog did absolutely nothing that night. Then Sherlock Holmes said, that is the curious incident. Why didn't the dog bark? So my puzzle was, why isn't there a nebulosity surrounding this pulsar, which is 10,000 times more luminous than the crab pulsar? So I came to the conclusion that the measurement must be wrong. The measurement must be wrong by many, many, many orders of magnitude. The magnetic field of this pulsar cannot be 10 to the power 12 Gauss, as the observation suggested. So again, we have this curious coincidence. You have a pulsar spinning with a period of 1.5 milliseconds, suggesting that it's very young, and its magnetic field, at least to me, suggested that it must be extremely small. So how come there is this coincidence between these two? So that reminded me of the Hulstaler pulsar, the same curious combination. But this was a solitary pulsar. There is no binary. But I was absolutely convinced that it must be a recycled pulsar. So what was happening was five days later, Professor Ostreicher from Princeton was coming here. How many of you have heard of Professor Ostreicher? At least two or three people. He is a big shot, Sandersteker's most distinguished student. And he was coming here. So Professor Alakshana told me, look, I'm sure they will have a story in uh, Princeton. So we must have a story. So we sat down and wrote a paper. And we, those days, you could go to the airport where the luggage comes to the, in the belt, old airport in Bangalore. And so then uh, Professor Radhakrishnan asked Ostreicher, do you guys in Princeton have a theory of this? So Professor Radhakrishnan said, well, we met in Dyson's office the day before yesterday. Nobody had any ideas. So Professor Radhakrishnan told him, give him our paper. So right there in the conveyor belt, I gave him this paper. And he was, in fact, the referee of that paper. So we, five days after the discovery of the pulsar, we sent a paper to current science and where we argued that this pulsar must be, must be a recycled pulsar. And it is spinning fast because it was spun up in a low mass X-ray binary. It is solitary because somehow the binary got disrupted. We had no concrete idea of why it got disrupted. We had some ideas, we mentioned that in the paper. And remember the story of uh, this morning. A neutron star will be spun up to an equilibrium period, which is given by accretion of the Eddington accretion rate of one Mount Everest per second, 10 to the 17 grams per second. And that period will be 1.9 millisecond b to the power 6 over 7 in those units. <coughs> And remember this also. This is the log B, log P plot. This is the equilibrium period line, which is uniquely fixed with no adjustable parameters, corresponding to the Eddington accretion rate. And what we discussed this morning is that the period to which it will be spun up depends on the degree of field decay. If the field didn't decay at all, it will be spun up to that period. If the field had decayed to there, it will be spun up to that period. If the field had decayed to that value, it will be spun up to that period. Remember, these ideas were not at all accepted. In fact, they were not accepted for a very, very long time after that. So here is the log B, log B plot. This is the spin-up line. And there is the binary pulsar, bang on the line. 
And that is where the IAU telegram said the millisecond pulsar is. So that didn't seem like a recycled pulsar, because if the pulsar is recycled, then the millisecond pulsar should be over there and not over there. So that is four orders of magnitude in the magnetic field, which is, remember, P dot goes as B squared. If B is down by four orders of magnitude, P dot is down by eight orders of magnitude. So this pulsar should slow down at all. So that's what it should be. So we wrote in our paper that the solitary millisecond pulsar must be a recycled pulsar. Don't ask me about where the binary is. Its magnetic field must be 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss, which is the dot on the equilibrium period line. And its period derivative should not be 10 to the power minus 14 seconds per second, which is the Crab Nebula's slowing down, which you can measure from morning till evening, but must be 10 to the power minus 19 seconds per second. That means in the entire history of the universe, it would have only slowed down by one millisecond, or even less than one millisecond. So that's what we said in the paper. Four months after we wrote the paper, a was, paper was published, we sent it all over the world, there was a paper from the Jordan Bank Group, Andrew Lyon et al. It was a paper in Nature where they had measured the period derivative of the pulsar, and the period derivative of the pulsar was 10 to the power minus 19 seconds per second, and the magnetic field was 4.7 times 10 to the power 10, 10 to the power 8 Gauss. Now, so. The paper came in the pigeon hole in the office with my name on it. And written in pencil over here was, thanks for your paper. It made interesting reading. But there was no reference inside the paper. Okay? So you'll hear more about that later on. So here is the story. The prediction was that the magnetic field of the pulsar should be 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. And the measurement showed that it is 4.7 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. So here is the, the full measured period now in the period derivative. And notice the error in the period derivative is incredibly small, ridiculously small. Now, we had said in the paper that the progenitor of this millisecond pulsar cannot be massive binary, like the progenitor of the Hulstaler pulsar, but it must be a low mass X-ray binary. It must be a low mass X-ray binary. Why? The reason is very simple. If the millisecond pulsar was spun up to a period of 1.5 millisecond, it would have to accrete the required amount of angular momentum. Since angular momentum is deposited by accreted mass, that angular momentum also tells you how many grams of matter should have fallen in. Because you know the specific angular momentum of the accreting matter, how many units of angular momentum per gram of matter. And that turned out to be a tenth of a solar mass. Therefore, the neutron star has to accrete a tenth of a solar mass to be spun up to 1.5 millisecond. This problem didn't arise for the Hulse-Taylor pulsar because its period is 59 milliseconds. So I omega is much smaller. So you didn't have to accrete that much mass and that much angular momentum. You could accrete it in 100,000 years without any problem. But here, you had a problem. Remember, the accretion rate limited by Eddington luminosity is one Mount Everest per second. So one Mount Everest per second translate to 10 to the power minus 8 solar mass per year. Therefore, to accrete tenth of a solar mass, the neutron star would have to accrete for 10 million years. Now, this is not possible in a massive binary, because in a massive binary, 
the mass transfer is over in a thermal time scale, in the kelvin helmholtz time scale, which is of the order of 100,000 years. But physically, why? It's a case of squeezing the toothpaste tube. So here is the picture I showed in the morning from Van der Havel's papers. So the companion star becomes a giant, transverse mass to the first born neutron star, and it is spun up. I gave you a problem. If the donor is more massive, the orbit will shrink. When the orbit shrinks, the Roche lobe will become smaller. It's like squeezing your toothpaste tube. And then it will transfer more mass. The orbit will become even smaller. Roche lobe will become even smaller. So it's a runaway mass transfer. So in a massive binary, mass transfer is a runaway mass transfer. And the neutron star cannot accept all this mass because of Eddington luminosity consideration. And it will leave the system through the second Lagrangian point. It will just go away. The neutron star doesn't accept. So you have to have sustained accretion at the Eddington limit for 10 million years or more. If you want to have that, you've got to have a low mass binary. You've got to have a situation where you have a neutron star and you have a companion whose mass is that of the sun or slightly less than the mass of the sun. Why? Two things. According to very elementary arguments, the more massive star, more massive the star is, the faster it will evolve. The less massive it is, the longer it will take to evolve. The sun will not evolve for another billions of years, many billions of years. Maybe another five, ten billion years, it will become a red giant. Because till then it will be just converting hydrogen to helium. It's not evolving at all. So here, so if you have a low mass star and there is a tube outside, which is our Roche lobe, then if, if, when it does become a giant, you can squeeze matter onto the companion. But there is a beautiful physics involved here. So listen to this very carefully. So let's go back to the Roche lobe once again. So here is our companion star, which has become a giant, and it is transferring mass to the neutron star. But this time, the donor is less massive than the neutron star. Neutron star is 1.4 solar mass whereas the donor is only one solar mass or 0.8 solar mass. Therefore, the orbit will expand and not contract. The orbit will expand. When the orbit expands, the Roche lobe will become bigger, and the giant star will no longer touch the Roche lobe. Therefore, they will not transfer any more mass. So you would think that mass transfer will stop. No, this is where gravitational radiation comes in. Because you have two stars going around each other, and, and the two stars will spiral in because it's emitting gravitational radiation. It is not the kind of gravitational radiation intensity that LIGO detects. This will be ridiculously small, but we are not trying to detect the gravitational radiation. We just want the orbit to shrink so that the Roche lobe becomes smaller again, and the star makes contact with the Roche lobe once again. So here is a very beautiful physics of sustained slow evolution and sustained mass transfer for 100 million years. It's possible, as detailed calculations tell you, but you need help from gravitational radiation and for the orbit to shrink. The very fact that we see LMXBs, about 140 of them in our galaxy, tells you that all these things must have happened. Otherwise. LMXBs will last only for a very short time. It will be a strange coincidence. Just when human beings are living in the galaxy, uh, LMXB is shining. You have to reject the hypothesis, right? So you have to accept these things. Right? So this is why the lifetime of X-ray phase can be much greater than 10 million or 100 million years. And that is why the progenitors of millisecond pulsars have to be low mass X-ray binaries and cannot be massive binaries. This irked people very, very much. Already they didn't like the idea of recycled pulsars, but now you're talking of a recycled pulsar coming from a low mass X-ray binary. This idea was not at all accepted for a very long time. I mean for a very long time, 20 years or 25 years. Now a couple of years after this discovery was made and we wrote the paper, a second millisecond pulsar was found. 
this one was in a binary and its companion is orbital period was 117 days and its companion was a low mass white dwarf exactly as you would expect from a low mass x-ray binary when the companion star has transferred all its hydrogen envelope and all that remains is a helium core white dwarf of the low mass star. So everything fitted in very beautifully. And so this discovery to us provided the definitive proof of the recycling scenario for the solitary millisecond pulsar, but there were no takers for this idea either. In March of 1986, a third millisecond pulsar was discovered. There was an IAU telegram, but its magnetic field was not measured. Its companion was not measured. We knew nothing about the mass of the companion or the orbit. So at that time, Deepankar Bhattacharya was a student here. He was working on completely different problems. But uh, even at the age of 23, it was very clear to me he was very versatile. So I said, look, let's work on this. So he took a few days off, and we worked on this problem together. And we came to a very remarkable conclusion, that although this is the third millisecond pulsar, we came to the conclusion that there must be a very large population of millisecond pulsars in our galaxy, numbering many tens of thousands, if not many hundreds of thousands. And a few days later, we sent a paper to Current Science, in which made, uh, we made a set of uh, remarkable predictions. Let me remind you, when the paper was written, the magnetic field of the pulsar had not been determined, nor was the nature of its binary companion. We predicted that this pulsar too should have a magnetic field of five times 10 to the power eight gauss. We predicted that its companion will be a low mass white dwarf and that the orbit will be perfectly circular, unlike the hull scalar pulsar, which is highly eccentric with an ellipticity of 0 0.7. And then we want, went on to make several more very far-reaching predictions. For example, there must be a very large population of millisecond pulsars. The overwhelming majority will be in binaries with circular orbits and low mass white dwarf companions. Their period of rotation will be between six and 10 milliseconds. And their magnetic fields will all be five times 10 to the power eight gauss. The strength of the magnetic field, we said, must be an asymptotic field, meaning it has reached the minimum possible value. And because it has reached a minimum possible value, the field cannot decay any further, and therefore this pulsar will live forever and ever and ever. So all these things, just from IAU telegram, of course, as one leading astronomer told me, you're sticking your, way, your neck way out. So I said, then only you can see through the window. So we wrote this paper, Deepankar was very nervous, but uh, we wrote this paper. More about this later on. How is it possible that when the population of low mass X-ray binaries is only about 125, how can the number of children be 10,000 or 100,000? How can the number of children exceed the number of parents by factor of 1,000 or 10,000? It's only possible if the children live 100 times or 1,000 times longer than the parents. The lifetime of LMXPs is already 100 million years. Therefore, millisecond pulsars must live for 10 to the 10 years or 10 to the 11 years, which is longer than the age of the universe. So the millisecond pulsars must live forever. All is from extremely elementary consideration. What does this tell us? Now here is the spin-up line. Here is the pulsar resurrected from the graveyard. Its field has decayed from 10 to the power 13, 14 to 10 to the power 8 gauss. But if its field continues to decay, it will die a second death. It was reborn again, but it will die again. But if the pulsar shouldn't die, the pulsar should live forever, field cannot decay. So that is why we came to the conclusion that the magnetic field of millisecond pulsar must represent an absolute asymptotic field. It has reached a limiting value. Why? That took another three years to figure out. 
So the large population of millisecond pulsars clearly tells us that the magnetic field of millisecond pulsars do not decay any further. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, says the Bible in the Easter section. So here is the paper, paper picture from the 1986 paper. Here is an asymptotic field. The neutron star dies a natural death. Its field decays for mysterious reasons, which we will now address. And then it was spun up, but this time it doesn't go down. It goes horizontally because its field has reached an asymptotic value. So we predicted in the paper that the majority of millisecond pulsars will be in binaries with low mass white dwarf companions. Their periods will be between 6 and 10 milliseconds, and their magnetic field will all be 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. So let me once again summarize the predictions made. There must be a very large population of millisecond pulsars. Most millisecond pulsars will be in binaries with white dwarf companions. Their fields will be 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. Their rotation period will be 6 to 10 milliseconds. Millisecond pulsars will live forever. Now, in the next lecture, this was morning, I should have ended with this, so I am now on borrowed time, so let me continue. So now we will change subjects completely. Um, I have to go here, right? No, no, we have to go to the other side. I have to, I have to go to the other, other file, rather. We haven't changed it. But luckily it is in the desk. No, it is. Oh, you close this. No, 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 no. No, no, my folder is there. I apologize. I should have done this at once. Yeah. All right. So let's begin lecture two. So this story of reincarnation of pulsars, uh, we discussed in the morning. So we'll skip this. It's fresh in your mind. But there were no takers for this idea, even though there were many successes. For example, the odd properties of the Hulse Taylor binary pulsar was successfully and quantitatively explained way back in 1978. And the magnetic field of the millisecond pulsar was predicted to be 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. It was 4.7 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. Then, in a few months later, in June 1986, when the properties of the third millisecond pulsar was measured by the Princeton group of Joe Taylor, it agreed exactly with what we had predicted. Its magnetic field was 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. It was a dead circular orbit, eccentricity of 10 to the power minus 5, as somebody said, as circular as a Mercedes-Benz ball bearing. Okay, And it's, uh, it, the mass of the white dwarf companion was 0 0.1 uh, solar mass. But still, there were objections. These objections were very irritating. The objection was the following. If you say these pulsars were spun up, why don't we see X-ray pulsars with such short periods? The answer was extremely simple and elementary, but nobody was willing to listen. I used to go on telling this every time, but nobody was willing to listen. Here was the argument. Here is the neutron star, and the accretion disk is in the, is in the, uh, the perpendicular to the rotation axis. Matter is stopped there at the alpha end radius, but matter can flow along the field lines because V cross B force is zero. When it falls on the poles, magnetic poles, it emits X-rays. And therefore, there'll be an X-ray hotspot, and because the neutron star is spinning, just like Jocelyn Bell's neutron star, there, there was no accretion. 
It was the dynamo that was producing the radiation. Here the radiation is from matter falling in. But nevertheless, it is for this reason that the X-rays will be seen in pulsation. The pity was that most of the X-ray pulsars are periods of 300 seconds, 500 seconds, 900 seconds, 800 seconds. None of them are a period of 59 milliseconds, let alone 1.5 milliseconds. This was the objection. But this was a ridiculous objection. But believe it or not, very senior, very intelligent astronomers were raising this objection for 25 years. The argument is very simple. This is what I showed you before. When the first born neutron star is accreting very lightly from the stellar wind of the companion, it becomes an X-ray source. It's an X-ray pulsar. It is break due to electromagnetic torque. I'll come to that in a little while. But when it starts accreting very heavily, and when it is being spun up, the X-rays are extinguished. X-rays are extinguished. They are absorbed. When neutron star is an X-ray source, the accretion is very light, and it's from a stellar wind. When there is and the strong electromagnetic torque breaks the neutron star rotation to hundreds and hundreds of seconds. But when the neutron star is spun up, the accretion is so heavy that the X-rays are quenched by the accreting matter. If there is hydrogen, then you have a photoelectric absorption. X-rays are extinguished. You know, this won't come out till it stops raining. We'll come to that. It stopped raining in 2014. But we are still back in 1982 or 86 or so. Okay, now let's continue with the story. To recycle a pulsar, its magnetic field must decay and it must be spun up. This morning we finished the discussion of how and why it is spun up and a detailed theory with no adjustable parameters of the spin-up. Now, we have to address a more difficult question, namely, how does the magnetic field of the neutron star decay? So let's now discuss, it's a beautiful problem in physics. So those of you who are studying astronomy at RRI, please go and tell your colleagues who are doing other things in physics about this. Very nice physics story coming up. Now, even before pulsars were predicted, Lo Volcher and Ginzburg, one of Landau's most distinguished colleagues in Moscow, they had predicted that neutron stars will have magnetic fields in excess of 10 to the power 12 Gauss because the stars have magnetic field, the sun has a magnetic field because there is a dynamo inside the sun. If the sun were to collapse because the solar matter is ionized, it will have a very high electrical conductivity. Alf Wain, magnetic field is frozen in a high, highly conducting medium. So when the highly conducting medium collapses, magnetic flux B R squared. What is flux? Number of field lines crossing a unit area of the surface. Surface area decreases as 4 pi R squared. Therefore, magnetic field should increase as R squared if flux is conserved. And Alf Wain says flux must be conserved because the conductivity is high. They gave the Nobel Prize for it. Okay. Now, therefore, for the exterior field to decay, the dynamo in the center must die. The dynamo in the center of the sun, like the dynamo in the center of the earth, are current loops. And these current loops must die. And therein lies the serious difficulty. So, before that, here are the facts. This is a view graph that I made must be 35, 36 years ago. I just scanned it. So this is the log B, log B plot. And here are 100 pulsars, a young pulsar. Today, 2,500 pulsars. And their ages are of the order of a million years or few million years. Here are the old pulsars. Their ages are billions of years. All these have high fields. All these have low fields. And what more, all these are binary. So again, Miss Marple will wonder, is there any connection between being in a binary and the field decay? So any viable theory of field decay in a neutron star must answer all these questions. 
Now, 2,500 pulsars known now. There is absolutely no evidence for field decay in solitary pulsars. Low field pulsars are always in binaries, except odd exception like the millisecond pulsar, which we have reason to believe came from binary. So the question is, how is the core field destroyed? Why is there a residual field in millisecond pulsars which are as old as the galaxy, maybe even as old as the universe? These are the questions any theory had to answer. What is the big deal in answering this question? So let's assume that the interior of a neutron star is classical matter, like the interior of stars we see in the sky. Then the magnetic field, the exterior dipole poloidal field, is produced by toroidal currents in the inside, inside of the star. These currents produce these fields. So for the field to decay, the currents must decay. How do currents decay? Currents can only decay due to ohmic dissipation. Maxwell's theory tells you that currents can decay. It's not in one of the Maxwell's equations, but you have to put Lorentz force into it, and then you can calculate this formula. This is the, you'll find this in Griffith's book or any electrodynamics book that you use. The ohmic dissipation time scale is of the order of 10 to the power 13 years, which is larger than the age of the universe. Why is it so large? Because sitting in the numerator are two quantities. One is the size of the current loop. In the case of the sun, the radius of the current loop is a million kilometers. But in the case of the neutron star, the radius of the loop is only 10 kilometers. So you would think that the ohmic decay time scale should be very short. But the electrical conductivity of neutron star matter is astronomically high. It is 10 to the power 29 inverse seconds. Why? If you remember from your solid state courses in your MSc Kittel's book, you'll remember that in classical physics there was a Drude formula, N e squared tau by m. That's all classical physics, Maxwell Boltzmann. But then when Fermi Dirac statistics came, then you have to redo the calculation of conductivity, which is done in Kittel's book. Now, in Kittel's book, you will find a plot like this. This is the energy bucket. What we are talking about are the protons. Forget about electrons. The magnetic field is produced by electron currents. But the electron currents are decaying because they scatter off protons. They scatter off inelastically, losing energy. That is another way of saying there is resistance, which is the reciprocal of conductivity. Now, it so happens that in a neutron star, this Fermi energy, that is the energy up to which all energy levels are occupied and all levels are empty, that is many millions of electron volts. In, in this metal, copper or whatever the metal is, brass, the Fermi energy is one electron volt or two electron volts. In a neutron star, the Fermi energy is millions of electron volts. So if you want to have resistance, the electrons have to hit the protons, and the protons must, if the electrons have to lose energy, the protons must gain energy. But the protons can't go anywhere. They can't change their energy without violating Pauli's exclusion principle, because all energy levels are occupied. And that extreme degeneracy of the proton is what causes this extremely large electrical conductivity, which gives you an ohmic dissipation time scale, which is larger than the age of the universe. Yeah, that's beautiful physics, the extreme degeneracy of the protons. You can't jiggle the protons much. In fact, we will now see that the protons will, in fact, be not just degenerate, they'll be superconducting. <coughs> OK, so therefore, in the classical picture, the interior of the neutron star is a classical fluid, like the sun and the other stars, then ohmic decay cannot destroy the field. So now we admit the possibility that the interior of neutron stars is not classical, is in fact a superfluid state, either superfluid like liquid helium or a superconductor like mercury or tin or niobium tin alloy or something like that.
Now, the prediction that neutron star interiors will be superfluid was again done before neutron stars were discovered. The papers were all written by Landau's associates, senior students and associates. Gilsberg was not Landau's student, but he was his associate. Migdal was Landau's student, one of the most distinguished students, of, and Kirschnitz, and so many other people, Larkin, they all worked on this problem. Why is probably mentioned in the next slide. In 1957, Bardi and Cooper and Schrieper constructed the theory of superconductivity of terrestrial metals. The preprint of that paper was available in America. Those days, there was Cold War, nobody went to Russia, Soviet Union, as it was called then. But some very senior people were allowed to travel. Bogolubov, a most distinguished physicist, was visiting America for a conference. He got hold of a preprint of Bardeen Cooper Schieffer paper and took it back to Moscow. And the moment Landau's kids saw these papers, they went to town. They realized you could immediately apply BCS theory and predict that neutron star interiors must be superconducting and superfluid. Ginsburg and Kirchnitz, I'm sorry I left out his name, they wrote a series of papers in Uzbeki predicting that neutron stars must be superfluid. And McDowell wrote a paper saying protons will be in a superconducting state. But they went on to say electrons will be normal because of the low mass and the low binding energy of Cooper pair. Now, you know, I hope you have, some of you would have studied elements of superconductivity in your solid state physics course. Well, I'll tell you about that in the next slide. It is essential that the particles involved, whether they are electrons or protons, must be attractive force between them. They must form a molecule so that instead of behaving like two fermions, they behave like a Bose-Einstein particle. Then only the possibility of superconductivity or superfluidity arises. Now, McDowell and Ginsburg used the bardeen cooper schieffer theory and calculated the transition temperature and they predicted that the transition temperature will be much greater than the internal temperature of the neutron star. They knew the interior of the neutron star must be 100 million degrees. But they argued that 100 million degrees is a very cold star. It is much colder than a bucket of liquid helium at a temperature of 1 Kelvin. So here is my fifth problem for you students. What does it mean to say cold or hot, high or low? These are meaningless statements in physics, absolutely meaningless statements. You have to compare something right, with something else. So I leave it to you to think about it and convince yourself why in a solid you have to go down to one degree Kelvin before you say it is a cold object. Whereas for a neutron star, even a temperature of 100 million degrees is ultra cold. So you think about it. You'll learn some beautiful basic physics. I'm not going to tell you the answer. Okay? When I started teaching 59 years ago, yes, and um, it's almost as old as millisecond pulsars. Um, um, the person for whom I was working in Madurai gave me this rule. He said, if a student asks you a question, you are forbidden to answer the question. You can only ask another question. And this should go on till the question is answered. So he always began his lectures for 32 years. He will begin the lecture in the following way. He will say, if I give you an ancient Chinese saying, if I give you a fish, you can have a good meal. But if I teach you to fish, you will eat well all your life. So he said, never answer questions. Teach them how to answer questions, but never answer questions, OK? So superfluidity is closely related to the phenomenon, phenomenon of Bose-Einstein condensation, which I hope RRI students, I'm told there is now a course on statistical mechanics you have to take. I hope you will learn about it. Otherwise, go to Landau and Lipschitz Statistical Physics. 
there is a beautiful discussion of bose strain condensation. Now, the macroscopic occupation number of a condensate is very large. That means below a certain critical temperature, all the atoms or molecules go to the zero energy state. That is Bose-Einstein condensation. And they don't violate Pauli's exclusion principle because they do not obey fermi dirac statistics. And that is why you have to take two electrons and put a rubber band around them so that they become bosons, so that they can condense. As long as they're fermions, they cannot uh, do this trick. Okay. Now, the most important property of a superfluid, and these are things that uh, I learned from uh, the horse's mouth when I was a student. People like Nambu and P.W. Anderson elucidated these things in the early days, saying that the superfluidity or superconductivity arises due to phase coherence of the wave function. Namely, if you have a bucket of super, uh, superfluid helium, then the whole bucket is a quantum mechanical system. It's not just atoms and molecules. So the coherence length of the wave function is as large as the system itself. What this means uh, is that for, to have a superfluid state or a superconducting state, you must have an attractive interaction between the fermions, between the electrons or the protons or the neutrons. Now, in the, in the case of and this attractive interaction should be strong enough that the transition temperature is below your temperature of the sample. Now, in the case of the electrons and metal, the attractive interaction is very weak. It's only a milli-electron volt. This is why superconductivity is a Kelvin phenomenon. Otherwise, these bound pairs, which are called Cooper pairs, the rubber band is broken up by thermal agitation. But in the case of neutrons and protons, you have it for free. You don't need to be clever like Cooper and get a free trip to Stockholm to find the rubber band. Here, nucleons are naturally attractive. And the mean binding energy between protons and protons and neutrons and neutrons is 8 million electron volts. So they are naturally attractive. So you should, it's a laughing matter that they should be superconducting and superfluid. Okay? And, but electrons is a different story, and they remain normal. So if you look in books like Kittel's book on solid state physics, you'll find the transition temperature to superconductivity is given by the simple formula, exponential to the power 1 over the attractive potential between the two fermions and the density of states at the Fermi level. Either you know it or you don't know it. If you don't know it, it doesn't matter. All you know is that if the denominator is large, because there is a minus sign, the transition temperature will be large, because there's a minus sign. OK? And that's what happened. V is attractive potential, and NF is the density of states of the Fermi energy. And now Bigdahl and Ginsberg, using BCS theory, estimated the transition temperature to superfluidity and superconductivity to 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, whereas the interior temperature of a neutron star after the first few weeks will be only about 100 million Kelvin. 100 million Kelvin is very, very cold, ultra cold. Okay? So, and this high TC is due to the strength of the nuclear attraction and strong degeneracy. Where does the degeneracy comes in? In the number of states at the Fermi energy. If it's strongly degenerate, Fermi energy is very large, the Fermi energy will be dependent on the density. If you remember your statistical mechanics course, Fermi momentum is density to the power 1 by 3. Fermi energy is density to the power 2 by 3. I did my MSc 50 years ago. I still remember this. You ought to remember this. That's why there is extreme degeneracy, because you're dealing with a density of 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter in a neutron star. Now, here is the wave function of a superconductor or a superfluid, and this is the meaning of the statement that there is long-range order and there is phase coherence. Theta is the phase of the wave function. <clears throat> if I know the phase of the wave function at one point, I can tell what the phase of the wave function would be at any other point. That is the meaning of the word, it is phase coherent. It is also true in a perfect crystalline lattice. 
It goes under the name of Bloch's theorem. You will find it in chapter 2 or 3 of Kittel's book. In a perfectly crystalline solid, there will be no resistance. Okay? There is perfect Galilean invariance. Everywhere in the solid looks the same. So wave function will be phase coherent. But what ruins it is impurities, dislocations, and things like that. OK. Now, the superfluid velocity is the, is the second term. It is the gradient of the phase of the wave function. So the velocity of a superfluid is defined as the gradient of the phase of the wave function. Now, this is a problem. Friends, <clears throat> this is now filled not with water, but with superfluid helium. Just imagine. If I spin this bottle, after a while, the water will also spin. Yes or no? But if I fill it with superfluid, the superfluid will not rotate. A bucket of superfluid, if the bucket rotates, the superfluid will not rotate because there is no viscosity between the, there is no conversation between the bucket and the fluid. But a fundamental reason for that is in order for rotation to happen, the curl of the velocity must be non-zero. There must be circulation. That means the velocity field must have a circulation. There must be a curl. This is why Maxwell constricted wheels and so on before he wrote his equation. When Maxwell wrote his equation, people didn't know about divergence and curl. That all came a few years after that, four or five years after that. Not from Maxwell, but somebody else. Heaviside was the person who did it. So Maxwell actually had mechanical models of wheels and things like that. So, but, but, the, but you know from your BSc physics that the curl of a gradient is zero. So a superfluid cannot rotate. So this was a fundamental problem in physics for 30, 40 years. Because elementary thermodynamics tells you that the free energy of the superfluid will be minimum if the superfluid also rotates with the same velocity as a rigid body. And this problem was finally solved by two people quite independently. One of them was Lars Ansager. How many of you have heard of Lars Ansager? One. What do you study? Sorry? Oh, no, what are you studying? Oh, wonderful. I'm glad two people have heard of. Ansager was one of those people. He was a chemist, actually. He wrote, he wrote 14 papers. At least three of them deserved Nobel Prize. One of them, he did get a Nobel Prize. But uh, he, he should have got at least three Nobel He only wrote 14 papers in his life. OK. Now, he solved this problem. And many years later, Feynman independently solved it in one of his most beautiful papers in Physical Review. Do read it. Do read it. If you don't want to read it, read Feynman Volume 3. You'll find a discussion there. So this. Feynman did many things, but if you asked him, as I have asked, occasion to ask him, do you consider anything you did as really great by yourself? Feynman said to me in 1967, yes. He said, my work on superfluidity. Not quantum electrodynamics for which you got the Nobel Prize. So he said this was a beautiful, beautiful paper. You should read it. So anyway, what did this great gentleman do and say quite independently? So here is a bucket of superfluid seen from above. The bucket is rotating with an angular velocity omega. What they said was that because the superfluid cannot rotate, it will create needle-like regions in the superfluid. Each needle, superfluidity is destroyed. Then it can rotate. So instead of the whole bucket rotating, I'm creating millions of rotating needles so that the total circulation adds up to as though they're rotated as a rigid body. But there was a problem. They knew already by that time from Landau's work, for which Landau got the Nobel Prize, 
that a superfluid is a quantum object. So you can't, everything must be quantized. Just as in an atom, angular momentum can only come in multiples of eight. Similarly here, circulation can come only in quantum units. So both Ansager and Feynman were smart enough, of course they were smart enough, to realize this. So what they said was, superfluid creates an array of vortices. The cores of these vortices are normal. And because it's a quantum fluid, the circulation is quantized. And the quantum of circulation is Planck's constant divided by the mass. Two comes in because two fermions combine to form a boson. So the mass of the boson is 2m. That's not so important. So this is the quantum of circulation. So the number of quantized vortices will be determined by, determined by the macroscopic circulation. So this is the circulation of one vortex. So I create n vortex so that n into h by 2m will give me the macroscopic circulation of the whole bucket as though it was rotating like a rigid body. So here, that's all theory, right? It took long time before you could see it. And first, it was seen in an experiment in a beaker of superfluid helium um, by a person in Berkeley. And he sent a postcard. He sent the paper to Feynman. Feynman sent him a postcard. I couldn't find it when I made this slide. I used to have it. Feynman sent a postcard saying, um, saying, dreams at night on a lonely night coming into physical reality many years later. So, but this, these are both Einstein condensates produced by cooling atoms between laser beams, the kind of things they do in the light and matter lab here and in other places in India. So each drop is a Bose-Einstein condensate, and these drops are being rotated. And what you're seeing are the quantized vortices. As I spin it faster and faster, you see the number of vortices is increasing, exactly as predicted by Ansager and Feynman a long time ago. So the number of vortices is proportional to the angular velocity of rigid body rotation. So let me now explain this. So this is, this is terrible. I don't know why it happened. Um, I'm told this is a, not a line X machine. But uh, anyway, this is supposed to be an integral with a circular integral. That is supposed to be a dot product. So it's integral V dot DL. That is the circulation. So V dot DL, if you integrate, you'll get 2 pi R, which is the circumference of this beaker, and omega R, which is the tangential velocity V. So that is the circulation. And the number of vortices it will create is n, v, and the circulation of each vortex is h by n. So this condition must be satisfied for all omega. So if a neutron star is spinning with a period of one second, then you can put that into this formula. Radius is 10 kilometers. There will be 10 to the power 16 vortices. So in a neutron star spinning with a period of one second, there'll be 10 to the power 16 Ansager Feynman vortices. If the neutron star spins down, slows down, what happens? Then these Feynman vortices will migrate outwards, hit the wall of the bucket, destroy themselves, so that at all times, there are just the right number of vortices so that n into the quantum of circulation is the total circulation. So by the same token, if the neutron star is spun up, you'll create more and more Feynman vortices, and they will move in towards the center. And both of these are important for us. Uh, <clears throat> we'll see. Now let us discuss proton superconductivity in neutron star. Now one of the properties of superconductors, which was discovered in 1933, is the phenomenon of Meissner effect. Superconductors are perfect diamagnets, so they expel the magnetic field. <clears throat> Here is a superconductor dunked in a bucket of liquid helium, and here is a magnet, and you see the magnet is levitating. 
So this is one of the fundamental properties of superconductor, is the magnetic field cannot penetrate. There is a depth of penetration associated that was discovered by Fritz London, and that is called the London penetration depth. So the phenomena of Meissner effect, the inability of the magnetic field to penetrate the magnetic field is deeply connected with the fact, for those of you who are interested, connected with this phenomena of broken symmetry. Superconductivity breaks what is called as gauge invariant symmetry. This was first pointed out by Yashiro Nambu, and then that became cornerstone of elementary particle physics ever then, ever since, broken symmetry. So that's where it all began, how to explain Meissner effect. Now, in 1935, a Russian experimental physicist called Shubnikov discovered a new type of superconductivity. In 1950, Ginsberg and Landau wrote one of the most famous papers in physics in the last century, the Ginsberg-Landau theory of superconductivity. There is, it is not a microscopic theory of superconductivity that, that, that came seven years later, but almost certainly that theory would not have been possible without the insights that was buried in this very, very, very prescient paper by Ginsberg and Landau. And in this paper, uh, Landau uh, and Ginsberg had already pointed out that there is another type of superconductivity possible. There are two important lengths in a superconductor. One is the London penetration depth lambda, which is the depth up to which the magnetic field can penetrate inside. The other is called the coherence length psi. That is the distance over which the velocities of two particles are correlated. There are two lengths in the problem. What kind of superconductor it becomes depends on which is larger. If the London penetration depth is larger than the coherence length, then you form a different kind of superconductivity, which is called a type two superconductor. If it is the other way around, you form what is called the type one or the normal superconductor. Today, not unlike when I was a student, when I was a student, there were only few superconductors known. Today, we know that almost every metal is a superconductor if you are able to cool it to low enough temperature. Pure metals always become ordinary superconductors. All alloys become type two superconductors. And this was already present in Landau Ginsburg paper. Now, one of the properties of type two superconductors, again, you may wonder what has this got to do with the price of fish? It is everything, because we are talking about a neutron star which has inherited a magnetic field of 10 to the power 12 Gauss. So what, whether it becomes a superconductor or not, internal family business, it still has to deal with the magnetic field. So that's why we are discussing type two superconductors. Now, one of the properties of superconductors is if you apply a large enough magnetic field, superconductivity is destroyed. If the magnetic field is low enough, superconductivity is not destroyed. It was discovered that there is an intermediate range of fields between two critical fields where the magnetic field can penetrate a superconductor. Just as a bucket of superfluid can rotate Remember, you all, we are always told rotation and magnetic fields have something in common. If you have a wire going, a current going in a loop, it produces a magnetic field. So that symmetry is built in Maxwell's equations. Okay? And so it's not surprising that we are about to say what we said in the superfluid in the presence of a magnetic field in a superconductor. So one of Landau's students, Abrikosov, constructed a successful theory of type two superconductor in 1958. But then Landau was a very strong master. One of the difficulties with being as clever as Landau was, and even Einstein, is very often they dismiss things wrongly. And many people suffered for it. Einstein's paper by Friedman, where he discovered the universe must be expanding or contracting, went to Einstein as a referee. Einstein held up that paper for two years. 
So Landau held up two Nobel Prize winning papers, not for two years permanently. Okay? Pauli did the same thing. Salam wrote a famous paper, Abdul Salam, saying parity must be violated in weak interaction. Made the mistake of sending it to Pauli. Pauli opened the drawer of his table, threw it in, and shut it, and locked it, and said, this is nonsense. But then somebody then went to Stockholm, two Chinese students of Chandrasekhar went to Stockholm for discovering parity violation. So same thing happened. In 2003, Abri Kosov was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work. What Abri Kosov said is magnetic field can penetrate a type II superconductor, but in quantized flux tubes. This is the quantum of magnetic flux, 8C divided by 2E. So those of you who are students, calculate this value. Flux is Gauss per square centimeter, or if you want Tesla per meter, whatever it is. Get a number for this. How much magnetic flux is there in one? You just have to go to Clark's table, put in HC and E. Either you know it by heart or look up Clark's table. So what, uh, what Abrikosov said is that if you have a type II superconductor, magnetic flux and external magnetic flux can penetrate. But inside the superconductor, it has to be in the form of a discrete flux tubes. And the number of flux tubes, so here, what you have seen here, is an actual superconducting flux tube in the laboratory. These are now called Abrikosov flexoids. So Abrikosov showed that these vortices will form a crystal lattice, depending on they'll form either body-centered, face-centered, cubic, like liquid crystals, it can be a pneumatic structure, or um, smectic A, smectic B, smectic C, all those things. So now people are using, I attended a conference here in the Indian Institute of Science many, many years ago, where I in fact spoke about this. There were four or five students of Landau, they had come, there was, there was the 50th anniversary of Landau's famous paper on phase transitions. And many of Landau's students had come, and I presented this work there. And that whole conference was about how these vortex lattices are being used like real lattices. Because you cannot manufacture these lattices in the laboratory. By changing the magnetic field, you can change the density of these vortices. You can see melting of these vortices. You can try out your renormalization group theories of melting on these vortex lattices and so on. So it's a big industry now. So these are real vortices in a superconductor just as I showed you real vortices in a rotating superfluid. So the protons in the core will form type II superconductors. Magnetic field will be confined. And you will say, why, don't the why wasn't the magnetic field expelled? Very simple reason. Then originally, the magnetic field was in electron currents. So the only way you can expel the field is to expel all the electrons. The protons are all inside. Electrons are all outside. You will create an enormous electrostatic field. We're not allowed to do that, because the net force on any particle inside must be zero for equilibrium. That's why you can't expel it. You can, it can be allowed to diffuse gradually, but then that's going to take 10 to the 13 years. OK? So question of, OK, so there it is. So the picture is, you, you, the external dipole magnetic field of a neutron star is due to an array of Abrikosov quantized flux tube in the core over there. Now, uh, the number, just as the number of Feynman vortices is related to the angular velocity of rotation of the bucket, the number of the Abrikosov vortices is again related to the strength of the magnetic field. R squared B is the flux, R squared is the area, R squared B is the flux. You divide the flux by the flux of individual quantum, and you get the total number of flux tubes you must have. So if you have a neutron star whose magnetic field is 10 to the power 12 Gauss, then there'll be 10 to the power 31 superconducting quantized flux tubes in the center. So there it is, 10 to the power 31 quantized flux tube. Now you'll say, now why can't these flux tubes be expelled? In 1964, Bardeen, can't argue about these things with Bardeen, he got two Nobel Prizes in physics, they showed in this paper that the spontaneous flux expulsion time from a superconductor is 10 to the power 20 years. So 
So it's not possible, simply not on. So if a magnetic field is frozen into the superconductor at birth, then you're stuck with it. So now, before we proceed further, let's have a quick one minute crash course on what you'll find if you went on a journey to the center of a neutron star. So there is a neutron star. Its mass is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. It's sort of as big as Bangalore, radius of 11 kilometers. And it has a solid crust, which is not shown to scale here. The crust, the crust is very thin, just one kilometer. So one kilometer of the crust, and the rest is fluid. Now what happens to the crust? The outer crust is iron 56 lattice. It is ferromagnetic. How do I know? Have I been there? No. Near the surface, the pressure is zero. There is nothing sitting on top of the neutron star. At zero pressure, the ground state, of the absolute ground state of matter is packing all the nuclei into iron 56 nuclei, packing all the electrons into iron 56 atoms, and packing them in a crystal lattice, which is ferromagnetic, to reduce the entropy of the electron. So a ferromagnetic iron 56 lattice is the absolute ground state of matter. Okay? It's an exact theorem. People like Freeman Dyson were involved in proving it. So you better accept that theorem. And if you come a little further in, not shown to scale, just a few meters deep, the density becomes so large, 10 to the power 11 grams per cubic centimeter, that the nuclei become so rich that they begin to spill out to the nuclei. They are radioactive nuclei. You will find elements which you don't find on Earth. See, the, on the periodic table, there are hardly elements, elements with atomic mass greater than about 135 or so. I don't know which is the heaviest element. There is Einsteinium, Fermium, and so on. But nothing very much beyond that. Here is problem number seven. Why aren't there elements with uranium is 92 protons? Why are there lots of protons in the universe? Uh, why don't we have elements with 500 protons, 1,000 protons? Words, why don't we have nucleus as big as a billiard ball or a ping pong ball? Think about it. Many years ago, we had the privilege of listening to Chandrasekhar speak about this in Indian Institute of Science. Yeah, the title of the talk was, Why Are the Stars As They Are? And along the way, I asked the question, why are the atoms as they are? So that's the question I have posed to you. So why don't we have nuclei with number of protons exceeding about 135 or so? OK. Now, these neutrons that are spilled out of the crystal lattice, they become superfluid, and there are vortices in them. But right in the core, which is really 90% of the neutron star, the density is nuclear density, 2.5 times 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. That is the density of nuclei that you and I are made of. Okay? The density of any atomic nucleus in the periodic table, just divide the mass by the volume, is 2.5 times 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter. You and I float in water, says because these nuclei are arranged far apart, and the average density is of the order of one. OK, so we are made of nuclear matter, just the same matter. And, and that is basically neutrons and protons are about 5%, electrons are 5%, and there are these vortices and fluxoids in them. So that's the structure of a neutron star. And this is the cover from January issue of 1990 of Current Science, in which we published the paper about which I'm now speaking. And what is shown there are two types of spaghettis inside the neutron star. One set of spaghetti is parallel to the rotation axis, or the Feynman vortices, and one set of spaghetti is parallel to the magnetic axis, which are the abricoso flux tubes. So that's the cover story. So to repeat again, so what you have are superconducting vortices parallel to the magnetic axis and superfluid vortices parallel to the rotation axis. So it's like a tennis racket 
with strings going in two directions, not necessarily at 90 degrees. Now, one day it occurred to me to investigate what happened if a Feynman vortex and an Abrikosa vortex come together. I came to the starting conclusion, they stick to one another and they stick like mad. The typical sticking energy, pinning energy, is as large as one million electron volt per connection. One, not small MeV, capital MeV. And there are 10 to the power 16 vortices and 10 to the power 31 flux tubes. And they're all touching each other and pinned with each intersection having an enormous spinning energy. So I came to the conclusion this must have tremendous astrophysical consequences. This problem had never been studied before by anyone. Why? Pinning of vortices and fluxoids to impurities and dislocation are very well studied. <clears throat> Why are they very well studied? If you want to make a powerful magnet, <coughs> to drive a levitation train, which they have in China and Japan. These go at 600 kilometers per second. You're lifting the whole train by superconductivity. Then uh, you need to produce very strong magnetic fields. Now, if you produce very strong magnetic fields, these are alloys. These wires are made of alloys. You have to produce these fluxoids. And that's why we haven't made this big breakthrough yet with room temperature superconductor. That is why the Japanese and Chinese trains, one of the wagons produces liquid helium to make the superconductors at very low temperature. Once they learn how to avoid the spinning of flux tubes to, vertices, I mean, to uh, impurities and dislocations, they will know how to make wires which are superconducting at room temperature. Okay? So then you can have 600 kilometer an hour speed, maybe even 1,000 kilometers per hour speed without any problem. But there is no terrestrial analog, my friends, of the coexistence of superconductors and superfluid. This is why nobody had studied this problem. A neutron star is the only object that I know of where in the same place there is both the superfluid, superconductor, both in vortex states. And they have to talk to each other, whether they like it or not. So this problem has not been studied before. And, and I came to the conclusion that there are many, many remarkable astrophysical consequences. And many more were discovered by Professor Rudeman, one of the popes of astrophysics. But we won't go into that story now. So there are two brands of spaghetti inside a neutron star. You have 10 to the power 16 Feynman vortices parallel to the rotation axis. And you have 10 to the power 31 quantized flux tubes parallel to the magnetic axis. They're all pinned with each other at multiple locations with very strong binding energy. Now, any viable theory of field evolution must satisfy, must answer all these questions that I told you before. Why is there no field decay in single pulsars? Why field decay occurs only in binary pulsar? What determines the degree of field decay? And why this field decay stops? in recycled pulsars. This very simple idea that I'm going to now tell you about answers all these questions at one stroke. I quantize vortices to the rescue. So what is plotted here is the rotational history of a new first born neutron star in a binary. At some stage, a neutron star is dramatically bricked. This is the period of rotation in the y-axis. This is time age since birth. So the period of rotation of the neutron star is dramatically lengthened to thousands of seconds, hundreds of seconds. And this is why most of the X-ray pulsars have periods of the order of hundreds of seconds, 500, 600, 700 seconds. So the neutron star is bricked. So I told you if I throw ping pong balls at the fan, it can either break the fan or spin up the fan. It depends upon whether the interaction occurs at a radius where centrifugal force exceeds gravity or gravity exceeds centrifugal force. So it's either accretion or expulsion. If there is expulsion, you're extracting angular momentum. 
So it is during that phase that the mag what happens when the neutron star is slowed down, the number of Feynman vortices, please remember, the number of Feynman vortices should always be related to the angular velocity of the bucket. So as the neutron star is slowed down, why is it slowed down? Because there is an external electromagnetic torque. We see evidence of it. And the number of vortices have to decrease. What do they do? They move. We see this in the laboratory in experiments. They migrate to the wall of the beaker and then annihilate themselves. So that at all times, the circulation theorem is satisfied. And here is the beautiful thing. As the neutron star slows down, and as the Feynman vortices migrate outwards, they drag along with them the superconducting flux tubes because they are tied to each other with very strong pinning energy. Although Bardeen has told us that spontaneously they cannot expel themselves, there is no reason why I cannot throw a fishing rod inside a neutron star, attach it to a superconducting fluxoid, and drag it out. I don't need a fishing rod because they're already inside. They are the Feynman or Ansager vortices, and they are pinned with strong pinning energy. And they are moving out because the neutron star is slowing down. So the superfluid vortices act like fishing rod. And therefore, the field is taken from the, from the core and deposited into the crust, where it can decay in reasonable time of few million years. Why? There is no superconductivity in the crust. It is a normal metal with electrons and protons and neutrons. It will have a ohmic dissipation time scale. It is not highly degenerate because the density is only a million grams per cubic centimeter and not 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter as in the center. And the size is very small. Size of the current loop is less than one kilometer. So the ohmic decay time scale, if you do the algebra, comes out to be a few million years. So I can kill the magnetic field in a few million years once I have transported the field from the core. So what I want you to remember, the core field is expelled not despite superconductivity. It is expelled because of superconductivity. If there was no superconductivity, there was no prayer of hope of the field decaying, because you have to rely only on ohmic dissipation. If, this, if there is superconductivity, it has, then the field has to be inside as vortices. Then you have to drag them out. And because they're in vortices, you are able to pull them out. If there are current loops, you can't pull them out. So that's why I say it, it is because of superconductivity, not despite superconductivity. Now, what determines the degree of um, field decay. So I showed this figure before. This is log magnetic field, log period. This is the equilibrium period line. The, the degree of field decay depends upon the extent to which the core field has been expelled. <coughs> what determines to what extent you have expelled the abricosa vortices? That is determined by, determined by what fraction of the Feynman vortices that have gone out, because they are the ones dragging them out. And what determines how many Feynman vortices have gone out? That is determined by, determined by how much you are able to break the star. Are you able to slow down the neutron star only to 500 seconds or to 5,000 seconds? If you are able to slow down a neutron star to thousands of seconds, then you will be expelling a much larger fraction of the Feynman vortices. Therefore, you will be expelling along with it a much larger fraction of the uh, superconducting vortices. And that determines, that is determined by the duration of the breaking. So the, then the question is, why is there an asymptotic field in 1986 when there are only three pulsars known and the third pulsar field had not been determined? We said it must be 5 times 10 to the 8, and all of them will be 5 times 10 to the power 8. What, why is that? How, at that time, we had no theory. This came in 1989-90. And the reason is very simple. That is, in, yeah, 
when a neutron star is spun up, see, it is during the slowing down phase that the flux is expelled. But finally, when the neutron star is spun up, more Feynman vortices are produced. And they will drag in the superconducting vortices back deep into the core, where they will remain forever, where the conductivity is infinite. It is superconducting. That is why there is a residual field. That is why the magnetic field of recycled pulsars do not decay any further. That is why millisecond pulsars can live forever. Otherwise, you cannot have 100,000 millisecond pulsars with only 125 parents. So that's shown again. That is a dramatic spin up. And what I'm saying is, when the neutron star is dramatically spun up to a millisecond period, then a very large number of Feynman vortices will be created, and they will migrate inwards. And since the quantized fluxoids are entangled with the Feynman vortices, the remaining fluxoids will be plus, I mean, pushed further inwards into the core, and there they will remain. And that is why there is a residual asymptotic field. So in this paper on current science, we put in this sketch. This is just hunch. There was no calculation. The conjecture was that there must be two distinct populations of recycled pulsars. One coming from massive binaries. And there we said, if the neutron star, this shows both the evolution of the magnetic field and the evolution of the spin. Okay, and, uh, and this is massive binary. And we conjectured that maybe in a neutron star in a massive binary, the neutron star is only slowed down to a few hundred seconds, and the residual field is only of the order of 10 to the 11 Gauss. Whereas in a low mass binary, the neutron star is spun down to maybe a few thousand seconds, and therefore the residual field will be of the order of few times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. This was a conjecture. This was a cartoon, not a calculation. This was 9th, January 1990. A few years later, uh, a student of mine, an Iranian student by name Jahan Miri, and Dipankar Bhattacharya, they revisited the problem. And Jahan was very good in his basic physics. And he, redid the he did the calculation and confirmed the cartoon that we had made. Indeed, there are two populations of uh, recycled pulsars. Those processed in massive binaries have asymptotic fields of the order of few times 10 to the power 10 Gauss. Those processed in low mass binary is five times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. This is the result of actual detailed calculations. I'm very sorry to say that uh, Jahan Biri passed away at a very young age. He suddenly had a heart attack and passed away. And he was barely 30. He was a very brilliant student. He was a student of the Joint Astronomy Program. Very clever guy. <coughs> he went back to Iran. Um, suddenly, the Iranian government canceled the scholarships of um, um, all Iranian students studying all over the world. And um, I managed to get him a fellowship here for a couple of years so that he could complete his PhD. And uh, there were reasons, which I cannot say in public, why the government of India didn't agree to giving him fellowship for longer. You can guess the reasons. Uh, so the main results of that little current science paper, there were several predictions. It was a, there was a novel mechanism for the magnetic flux expulsion from a superconducting interior. No such mechanism had ever been known before. And this mechanism explains why the field decay occurs only in mass transfer binaries. Because only in mass transfer binaries, a neutron star can be slowed down. This isolated pulsar, like the Crab pulsar, will only slow down to a period of two seconds or three seconds in 10 million years. And you are not going to expel very much flux outside. It expels why there is a residual field. And also, it explains why there are two populations of recycled pulsars, those with fields of the order of 5 times 10 to the power 10 Gauss, and those with fields of 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. 
So there were six predictions made in the paper. Now, yet another puzzle of the 1980s um, concerned the gamma ray emission for the galaxy. Now, we are changing a different story. From, we are changed to a different Netflix film, as you would say. Gamma ray astronomy at the time was in its infancy. There were two satellites, SAS-2 and COSB satellites. They produced some maps of galactic gamma ray emission. This is the gamma ray emission looking straight towards the center of the galaxy at different galactic longitudes. This is the center of the galaxy. This is looking above the plane and below the plane. This is the latitude profile. The top panel clearly tells you that there is significant emission at high latitude. This also tells you that there is significant emission. What do I mean by that? How are gamma rays produced in the galaxy? Gamma rays are produced in the galaxy when cosmic rays which are coming from other galaxies and in our own galaxies, galaxy like supernova remnants and pulsars, go through molecular clouds. And the emission mechanism is a Bremsstrahlung. A proton or an electron breaks when it comes near an atomic nucleus in the molecular cloud and it emits gamma rays. Therefore, you would expect the profile of gamma ray emission to mimic the profile of molecular clouds in the galaxy. Now, molecular clouds in the galaxy form a very thin layer of only about 150 light years above the plane and about 150 light years below the plane which is very thin. So a galaxy in molecular cloud is as thin as a sada dosa. Okay, very thin. So you would expect gamma ray emission to be confined to this very thin layer about the plane of the galaxy. But you will see gamma ray emission at very high latitude. So the, therefore, the origin of the gamma ray emission from high galactic latitude was a big mystery. Where did they come from? Now, is there a puzzle? Now, experts of gamma ray astronomy dismiss this as nonsense. They said, look, these are primitive satellites. And all this gamma ray emission is instrumental in origin. This is not real. OK, I tell you. 99% of the progress made in astronomy in the last 100 years is entirely due to observational astronomers. And 90% of that is entirely due to engineering and technology detectors. Okay? And yet theoretical physicists hold them in contempt. They are low-class citizens. Okay? So, so this is instrumental. You just dismiss it. Okay? But later data, look at this data. Look at the error bars. How can you dismiss this as instrumental? This is beautiful data. OK, so this is not instrumental. I never thought it was instrumental. Now, there is another school of thought that said, but, but don't forget young pulsars. We know the crab pulsar emits gamma rays. We know the vela pulsar emits gamma rays. But the problem is, the crab pulsar is only 1,000 years old. And vela pulsar is only 10,000 years old. If you look at older pulsars, there are no gamma, there is no gamma ray emission from them at all. Now, uh, the problem with pulsars was that one expects gamma ray emission from only young pulsars. And young pulsars, where will young pulsars be? Young pulsars will be born where massive stars are born. Massive stars die in supernova explosion, produce neutron stars. Where are massive stars born? In molecular clouds. Therefore, where do you expect young pulsars to be? Near molecular clouds. In the z direction. In the xy direction, they can move away from the molecular cloud, but not in the z direction. Yes, they do migrate, but they will also slow down, and their dynamo is getting weaker. Therefore, you don't. Uh, it is true that pulsars migrate from their birthplace, 
but by the time they reach any respectable latitude, their rotation periods would have lengthened. And their dynamos would become so weak that the voltage generated by the dynamo would be so low that it can produce radio waves, but not gamma rays or X-rays. Okay? So pulsars also roll down. So the point I'm making here is that the high field pulsars age very quickly. I told you that the, here it is. The rate of lengthening of the period is proportional to B squared over P. Therefore, high, P, high field pulsars will age very quickly. And therefore, the voltage generated by the dynamo will weaken very quickly. Therefore, pulsars are not the solution for the thing. OK? Therefore, neither the interstellar medium nor pulsars could invoke, could be invoked to explain the high latitude galactic gamma ray emission. So this was the puzzle in the late 1980s. Now, gamma ray astronomy at the time was 1.5 sigma result. I see Sita sitting there. She is a very good experimentalist. She will not take any result seriously if it is a 1.5 sigma result. She would demand at least five sigma result. Today, gamma ray astronomy is 11 sigma result. At that time, it was one sigma result. So not many people took this seriously. But I always had respect for experimentalists. I had known Sita since she was a student. A great respect for people. So I said, I'm going to take this gamma ray seriously and find an explanation for it. No, you, you, you may think it's funny. I'm not trying to be funny at all. Nobody took it seriously at that stage, simply because they couldn't explain it. So I made a prediction how long ago? Long time ago. June 1988, I, went to a, I was asked to speak in a conference, very important conference, where all the gamma ray and X-ray guys attend. It's called COSPAR General Assembly. It was in Finland. They asked me to give a talk on gamma ray emission from pulsars. It was an invited review talk, not my own work. And I decided there were all these high priests of pulsar were sitting in the audience. And I'm not going to go there and tell them what they have written in their papers. So I said, if I'm going to speak at all, I must say something original. Okay? So I got up there and said this. I said that there must be a new population of gamma ray sources. And this, is, this will explain the high latitude gamma ray emission. Okay? That was in June 1988. What was the basis of the argument? I was absolutely convinced that millisecond pulsars should emit gamma rays for the same reason that young pulsars do. Although their fields are many orders of magnitude smaller, they're also spinning fast. The voltage generated by the dynamo depends on two things, how fast you cycle and how strong is the magnetic field in the dynamo. And this is the point that everyone had overlooked. Stated slightly more scientifically, you have to go to the light cylinder. So I'll try to explain to you what the light cylinder is. This is a neutron star. This is the magnetic field. It's spinning about this axis, about this vertical axis. So all charged particles which are attached to the magnetic field will have to go around to the magnetic field. Okay, And they will go around at the same angular velocity as the neutron star has. So you realize at some distance c, some distance r, which is given by this distance, v is r omega. So the distance c over omega, the velocity will become equal to the velocity of light. OK? The velocity of a particle. See, there is a cycle wheel with the spokes. I'm rotating the cycle wheel. The spokes are also rotating. Charged particles are attached to the spoke. So the charged particles will have to co-rotate with the star. Longer the spoke, more will be the tangential velocity. If the spoke is long enough, at some distance, the tangential velocity will become equal to c. Now it turns out that the X-rays and gamma rays of pulsar 
is produced near the light cylinder and not near the surface. The reason is very simple. Near the surface is where most of the voltage drop is. That is where you produce photons, but you produce gamma rays. But why are we not talking about gamma rays? Because they don't get out. They hit magnetic field lines and produce electron positrons. They are degraded. So you have to go out to the light cylinder so that if you are able to produce gamma rays, then the magnetic field has very small optical depth photons can escape. So one line summary is gamma rays and X-rays and pulsars are not produced near the polar cap. They are produced near the light cylinder. How far is the light cylinder? The cap pulsar is spinning 33 milliseconds. So the light cylinder is light travel distance in 33 milliseconds. How far is the light cylinder for the millisecond pulsar? Light travel distance in one millisecond. It is true that the magnetic field is smaller, it's decreasing of one over r cube, but also you are at a shorter distance. So I came to the conclusion that the voltage developed near the light cylinder of the millisecond pulsar will be the same as the voltage developed near the light cylinder of the cap pulsar. Because what is lost in the magnetic field is gained in the spin period. So I was absolutely convinced. So, but how can one or two pulsars produce um, a whole background of high galactic? So, so my point was, because millisecond pulsars hardly slow down, they will not age. So young pulsars remain young forever. They have drunk a youth elixir, they, unlike crab and vela pulsar. They become old. Millisecond pulsars will never age. Therefore, they will produce gamma rays forever and ever and ever. And according to Deepankar and me, nobody else in the world believed us, there must be hundreds of thousands of millisecond pulsars. So I was absolutely convinced that in June 1988, that the high latitude gamma ray emission must be due to a large population of millisecond pulsars. At that time, my friends, only three millisecond pulsars were known, and none of them emitted gamma rays. So it was an atrocious suggestion made by me in the presence of all the high priests. Sunyayev was there, and all the big shots in X-ray and gamma ray astronomy were there. So naturally, I was laughed at, and my prediction was summarily dis dismissed. But we'll return to that in a few minutes. Now let us take an overall look in this Platinum Jubilee year, after walking down the memory lane, of the various predictions that I have told you about. By the way, there were many other areas where extremely important work was going on. Liquid Crystal Lab was making wonderful discoveries, which was widely known. and. Uh, in the theoretical group, Bala Ayer was working very hard calculating the signature of the ga ga gravitation wave burst. Should one someday detect coalescence of two neutron stars? It was a back breaking work which took 20 years to do. There were a lot of other things. I chose things that I was involved in. So don't be under the impression other things were not going on. Okay? And I think on seven, November 7th last year, somebody did give an overview of everything going on in astronomy. This is a personal walk down memory lane. Uh, so the first thing was July 1976. The first born neutron star will have a low field and short period, like the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. Second born neutron star will have a high field and long period. 1980, the solitary millisecond pulsar will have a field of 5 times 10 to the 8 Gauss. The third millisecond pulsar will also have a field of 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss, and the companion will be a low mass white dwarf, and the orbit will be dead circular. The progenitors of millisecond pulsars must be low mass X ray binaries. There must be a very large population of millisecond pulsars, well in excess of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. All their fields will be around 5 times 10 to the 8 Gauss. 
millisecond pulsars will live forever. Millisecond pulsars will be a new population of gamma ray sources. There will be two distinct populations of recycled pulsars, those with fields around 10 to the 11 Gauss and those with fields around 10 to the 8 Gauss. So these were the predictions. Now let us look at the status of these predictions made, one by one. Massive binaries prediction was made in 1978 and 80. Work was done in 78. The paper came out later for reasons recalled. The figure was lost by the journal and unfortunate things like that. Confirmation came only in year 2004, a long time. This explains why nobody believed in the idea of recycled pulsar. Here is the cover of Science Journal, one of the most prestigious journals in the world. Finally, somebody found a two neutron star system, both pointing towards us. One was rapidly spinning at a low magnetic field. Other was slowly spinning at a high magnetic field. So this must be the recycled pulsar, and this must be the second bond pulsar. This is the prediction that was made in 1980. Okay, I said, someday, if they discovered binary where both are pointing towards you, this is what you will find. Now let's look at the next prediction. The solitary millisecond pulsar must have been recycled in a low mass binary. Somehow the companion got destroyed. The prediction was made in 1980 paper. And the confirmation came only in 1988, when another millisecond pulsar was discovered. A very remarkable millisecond pulsar an eclipsing millisecond pulsar. There is the pulsar, there is the companion, a low mass white dwarf, and the radiation beam of the pulsar is in the plane of the orbit. So the, so, so the pulsar is going around on the tabletop. Here is the companion star. I'm sorry, the companion star is going around. The pulsar is rotating about itself. The pulsar beam is going around, but the pulsar beam is in the plane of the table. So every time the beam hits the companion star, here it is, every time the relativistic beam from the pulsar is hitting the companion star. And we know that there is a very strong relativistic beam from the crab pulsar because that is what finally radiates in the crab nebula. That was the great mystery that took 45 years to solve. So we know there is a relativistic beam from the crab pulsar because that is what is radiating in the crab nebula. What radio astronomers found is that this relativistic beam, when it hits this white dwarf companion, is ablating the companion. It's just blowing away the companion. Technically, what they found was that the dispersion measure was tremendous. Dispersion measure tells you how different frequencies are slowed down in a plasma. Different frequencies travel with different speeds. Okay, because the dielectric constant or the refractive index is a function of frequency. Okay, one minus omega p squared divided by omega squared. And so what radio astronomers found was solid evidence of this small white dwarf being ablated away. And the theoretical calculations done by very reliable theoreticians some very young Russian theoreticians, shows that in about a couple of million years, this companion will be gone. I'm not saying it is happening every time, because most, binary, most millisecond pulsars are in binaries. But in an odd case, like the first one, such a thing could have happened. Next, progenitors of millisecond pulsars must have been low mass binaries. Prediction was made in 1980. Confirmation came only in the year 2014. That's 34 years later. People said, where are the rapidly rotating X-ray pulsar? In 2000, here was a low mass X-ray binary. In 2009, the X-ray stopped, and they found a radio millisecond pulsar there. Now, that's not enough. A few years, the smoking gun was finally found. More than that, 
this particular system seems to be going back and forth. Sometimes it is accreting from the accretion disk, then you don't see the radio waves, you see only LMXB. Sometimes the accretion stops, for what reason we don't know, then you see the already spun up millisecond radio pulsar. So it's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So this is the final nail in the coffin. This proves beyond doubt that millisecond pulsars do come from low mass X-ray binary. An intriguing possibility. Lowest order gravitational radiation is due to quadrupole movement. The lowest order electromagnetic radiation is due to dipole movement. That's why a charge going around in a circle will emit uh, electromagnetic radiation. So that's the formula from, uh, from your book, um, Jackson or any book, Landau Lipschitz. So the, it's proportional to the third time derivative of the quadrupole moment whole square. As matter accretes at the magnetic poles of the neutron star, there'll be a little mound, a little hillock due to the accreting matter. Remember, it is raining one Mount Everest per second. It is raining one Mount Everest per second for 100 million years. So there'll be a little bump there. So there'll be a quadrupole moment, a time-changing quadrupole moment. So the luminosity of gravitational radiation is proportional to the sixth power of the frequency. The quadrupole moment changes as sine or cosine. So you take three derivatives and square it, you get sixth power of the frequency. In dipole radiation, you get fourth power of the frequency. OK. So as the neutron star is spun up to a period of millisecond, gravitational wave luminosity could be significant. Therefore, these transient millisecond pulsar system, now half a dozen or no. So an improved version of LIGO or other such detectors that are being built can think of working in a resonant mode because you know the frequency. So you can go on adding data like radio astronomers do when they bin pulsar signals into things. So this is for the future. I shouldn't say anything more because <laughs> Dr. Ayer is sitting here and he knows infinitely more than me about these things. So let's go to the next prediction. There must be a very large population and their fields will all be five times 10 to the eight Gauss. This prediction was made when only two millisecond pulsar fields were measured and millisecond pulsars will live. This prediction was made in 1986. Let's look at the current data. So this is a plot from the 1986 paper. This is the plot from the 1986 paper, that there will be an asymptotic field. Most millisecond pulsars will be here. Their periods will be between 6 and 10 milliseconds. Their magnetic field will be 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. And there will be a very large population. This is the current data, the logarithm of the magnetic field. This is the logarithm of the spin period. And there are more than 100 binary millisecond pulsars there. And you see the fields are all clustering around 10 to the power 8 Gauss to 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. So that's pretty good. So that's the original prediction from 1986. So let's look at the next prediction. There will be two distinct populations of recycled pulsar. Prediction was made in 1990. Let's look at the current data, the population of recycled pulsar. There is the plot with 2,700 pulsars and recycled pulsars. That is the spin-up line. And those, that is the population one, binary pulsars with massive companions, and their fields are around 10 to the power 10 Gauss. And this is the population of millisecond pulsars with low mass white dwarf companions. And their fields are of the order of 5 times eight, 10 to the power 8 Gauss. So this prediction is also confirmed. So let's look at the last prediction. Millisecond pulsar will be a new population of gamma ray sources. Prediction was made in 1988. The discovery was made in 2009, long time after that. What was the prediction made by me in the talk? This is a slide that I showed. This is the diffuse gamma ray high latitude emission, which was dismissed as instrumental. I argued that the high latitude emission may appear diffuse because of the poor angular resolution of the telescope. You go out on a rainy night, those of us who are wearing glasses, 
there's water on the rain, all the street lights, you can't see them as di distinct. You see some blur of light. After the rain stops, you wipe your glasses and wear, you see street lights there. So I argued in my Helsinki talk that someday, when the sensitivity and angular resolution of the telescope improves, the diffuse high latitude emission will be resolved into discrete sources. Many of these discrete sources may turn out to be a population of millisecond pulsars. So to remind you when this prediction was made, in only three millisecond pulsars were known, and none of them emitted gamma rays. 21 years after this prediction was made, here is the cover of Science Magazine once again, NASA's Fermi Large Area Gamma Ray Telescope. And here is the paper with 146 authors. And the title of the paper is Population of Gamma Ray Millisecond Pulsar, seen with the Fermi Telescope. There are the pulsars. The high latitude diffuse emission has disappeared and has been resolved into individual pulsars. And there it is, more than 115 now, and all have fields five times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. These are also all, are telling gamma is being used by the telescope, and reverse also, it is working. I didn't know anything about this. I'm a retired person. I have no access to journals or something. Then some student in Pune said, I'm giving a journal club talk, sir. I remember a long time ago you talked about it, and she sent me this, this particular paper. Now, I have time to conclude. One would say that, that the astronomers at RRA have done reasonably well. Now, unfortunately, although all the predictions, you saw every one of the predictions, was confirmed. Unfortunately, it took a long time. It took a long time for various reasons. Um, uh, camera astronomy had to come of age, and there were some serendipitous discoveries like the double pulsar and so on. But in no case there have been references to our papers. In no case. Systematically. For example, when the millisecond pulsar paper, we wrote the paper, uh, and sent it all over the world. Four months later, the magnetic field was measured. It was bang on what we had predicted, but the paper had no references. In 1986, I went to China, and the day before the conference, Professor Ravakrishnan was a crowded room in which there was a party reception. So he called me from the other end of the room. I went there, and he introduced me to Professor Joe Taylor, who got the Nobel Prize for at the discovery of the binary pulsar. I had not met Joe Taylor before. So he told me, uh, congratulations, you had, I read your paper. We have verified all the predictions that you had made in the paper, paper Dipankar Bhattacharya and I wrote. Next morning when the conference began, he asked Professor Radhakrishnan, who was the first chairman of the session, he said, can I have five minutes? I have an important announcement to make. He goes and gives a five-minute talk, and there is no reference to the fact that all these predictions were made three months earlier by me and the Pankar Bhattacharya. But the previous evening, he congratulated me. Okay, But we are talking of very great people, and Nobel laureates. And it continued. When millisecond X-ray pulsations were first discovered in 2000, it became a big news in America and Europe. It was on television. It was on newspaper editorials. But no mention was made that the idea of recycled pulsars is from the Raman Institute from way back. And the tragedy was that this was from the Institute in Amsterdam with whom I wrote the first paper in astrophysics with Professor Pandanover. And Pandanover's student wrote this discovery. But they don't attend seminars anymore, like students, like people here. So they didn't know about earlier papers. Okay? And then the fact that there was there is clinching evidence, the low mass X-ray binaries are the parents of millisecond pulsar. There is no reference in that paper. And when only three millisecond pulsars were known, none emitting gamma rays, I predicted there must be a large population of gamma ray millisecond pulsars. And then when this paper was written with 146 authors, there was no reference to the paper. Two very senior astronomers were so upset by this. 
They sent the editor of science my original papers published in 1988-1990. They sent them actual hard copies of the paper. They said, what can we do? The authors didn't put it in. Then the authors said, we are only allowed to put in so many references. So they argued, but look, shouldn't you give reference to the paper that predicted this 25 years ago? Nothing, OK? So, so that is the exclamation mark. So let me end with the final thing. What is the moral of millisecond pulse art? So for those of you from Christ and St. Joseph, or whatever colleges you may be, following Lawrence Bragg, if tomorrow somebody asks you, do you remember at least one sentence, this is the sentence you must know. Millisecond pulsars are dead pulsars, which were resurrected from their graveyard and spun up to ultra short period of rotation. And in their reincarnation, they will live forever. They are incorruptible. What does incorruptible mean? When you go to Westminster Abbey in London, where all the great kings and queens are buried, including Isaac Newton and more recently ashes of Stephen Hawking and so on. As you come out, you see the great composer, George Frederick Handel. And he's holding in his hand the musical score from his oratorio, The Messiah. And what that aria says is from the Bible. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. As I said, Christ is crucified on Good Friday. But when he comes back, the Bible says he's incorruptible. The meaning of the word incorruptible is there will be no further decay. It'll live forever. So that is why in my first paper on millisecond pulsar, I used this quotation. Millisecond pulsars are incorruptible. And so let me conclude. Right here in this room, standing right where I'm standing, one of the great theoretical physicists of the last century, Sir Herman Bondi, was a very great physicist. He stated, he said, there is a, I'm going to tell you a theorem. The theorem is the following. Take any topic T. This is what he called. Take any topic T. There will be 300 people all over the world working on the topic. They will form a mutual admiration club. You quote me, I will quote you. You invite me to your conferences, I will invite you to your conferences. He said, don't bother about these things. Finally, what matters is the worth of what you have done. So even though in the conventional sense that the work that we did here has got not poor recognition, I think it's fair to say it has got zero recognition, um, there was recognition from quarters privately uh, from people like P.W. Anderson, Dijen, the great Ginsburg, Larkin, Migdal, they were Landau's original student, Sam Edwards, and many others. And one of the comments that I cherish most was standing right, right outside below this building, down outside the administrative office's office. In 1985, February, there was a meeting of the Golden Jubilee meeting of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Professor Chandrasekhar came for that, and he gave the Golden Jubilee Memorial talk. And uh, he presented that bust of Ramanujan to the Indian Academy of Sciences, which is in the library. And he didn't attend any of the talks in the Academy meeting. My talk was a very, very, very last talk. And I had put it as the last talk because I was the secretary, and I thought others should get priority. Just before my talk, Chandrasekhar walked in. And so everybody in the room was very stunned that he walked into my talk. And after the talk, I couldn't meet him because I had to rush, because I had arranged a concert by Ember Subalakshmi in Chaudhaya Hall. And I had to rush there to receive her. But next morning, Chandrasekhar was, came here. And he said to me, I remember as if it yesterday, he said, it's marvelous that you could deduce all these wonderful things based on such simple considerations. That's all he said. So that's all that matters. 
uh, it really doesn't matter. So let me conclude, therefore, <coughs> on the following note, which I think is worth keeping in mind when we embark on a pursuit of science. We have to ask, what is our motivation? Here it is. Let me read it for you. The pursuit of science has often been compared to the scaling of mountains, high and not so high. But who amongst us can hope, even in imagination, to scale, scale the Everest and reach its summit when the sky is blue and the air is still, and in the stillness of the air, survey the entire Himalayan range in the dazzling white of the snow stretching to infinity? None of us can hope for a comparable vision of nature and of the universe around us. But there is nothing mean or lowly in standing in the valley below and awaiting the sun to rise over Kinchunjunga. This was Chandrasekhar's talk in that same meeting. And he did achieve mightily in physics for 65 years. So when we feel disappointed, it is worth remembering there is nothing low standing in the valley and looking at the mountains. <clears throat> so I thank you very much for giving this, giving an old man this opportunity to recall an old story. And thank you for your patient hearing. As I said to somebody while walking back for lunch, I did not know about this series. I realized this talk is not appropriate for 80% in the audience who are college students. But if you people are interested, I can come back at some other time and give a series of lectures on a topic which we can arrive at by mutual discussion. And I assure you that will be blackboard talk, none of these PowerPoint slides, where you can take notes and ask questions any number of times. Thank you very much, and I would welcome any questions that you have. Thank you, Srini, for the beautiful exposition. And we will down the uh, walk down the beautiful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Srini beautiful exposition and the walk down the memory lane. Um, will you take a few questions? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, there is, of course, coffee outside. You can... But it's more efficient to ask here so the others can listen. Are there any questions? So, I'm, li I'm listening. Uh, yeah. At the start of the lecture, you said we use an array of millisecond pulses to find uh, low frequency gravitational waves. So how is that done, sir? Like how, like how do you consider an array of MS millisecond pulses? <coughs> it goes like this. It's somewhat involved. The idea is extremely simple and elementary, but um, technically it is very involved. If, if, I, if I have a ring, imagine I'm holding a ring, <clears throat> and I put four objects on the ring, here, there, there, here. And if a gravitational wave passes through it, because it is quadrupole radiation, this is what the four masses will do. They'll come this, this will go there, this will come in, this will go there. So the relative distances between them will change. And depending on the direction in which the gravitational wave is coming, if I have a whole lot of them, this was a simple geometry, four masses in a plane, and a transverse wave coming. But waves are coming from all directions. So if I have a collection of, say, 20 millisecond pulsars, then as this low frequency gravitational wave slosh through the universe back and forth, these millisecond pulsars will bob up and down in suitable directions in response to the gravitational wave. Because what is a gravitational wave? It is the perturbations on the, it is the propagation of the perturbations 
of the space-time curvature, right? So uh, since space-time curvature is what results in acceleration, see, what Einstein said was gravity is not a force. It's an acceleration, and that acceleration is metrical in origin. Namely, if there are curvatures, it will cause acceleration. Now, you are having changes in the acceleration, OK? I mean, changes in the curvature. So these millisecond pulsar distances between them will change. And in particular, distance between them and some inertial frame will also change in a periodic manner. Question is, how do you detect it? So what you have to do is to detect the position of a pulsar. I said the, the pulses from a pulsar come as tick, tick, tick. They don't do anything like that. <laughs> First of all, a pulse from a pulsar, a typical pulse from a pulsar, doesn't look like a Dirac delta function. It might look like this, extending over a fairly long duration of time lasting hundreds of milliseconds, but all within one pulse, OK? So the name of the game to find the position of a pulsar is to find differences in arrival times. If the pulsar is not moving with respect to the inertial frame, then once you have got all, then a lot of general relativity goes in. Because between the pulse and here, there are all kinds of other accelerations, solar system effects, Shapiro delay, uh, redshift. You have to remove all of those things. If you, after removing everything, everything in an inertial frame, you do expect pulses to come tick, 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 tick. But pulsars are not like this, like this. So what you have to do is to observe long enough so that you find some fiducial point in a pulse, which you can see as a marker, and then ask, is this fiducial point arriving sooner or later? And if it is coming, if the change is periodic. And that requires very, very, very hard work. This industry is called timing of pulsars. We want to know, ask the radio astronomers here, or uh, Balchan Joshi in GMRT wrote a nice article, if you Google, if you, you'll find it. What is the physics of timing? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a question of removing the residues it's a, how did Penzias and Wilson discover the microwave background radiation? The noise is three degrees. But there is much more noise coming from everything. So you have to remove everything. It's a question of residuals. Go on removing all known sources and then ask, is the residue believable? Believable, believable. And, and it took them about 30 years to do that. And they now think they have timed. By timing, I mean they now know the arrival times of the pulses from about 20 millisecond pulsars, if they were absolutely stationary with respect to an inertial frame. We don't have an inertial frame, but the closest thing we have to inertial frame is the barycenter of the solar system. But the sun is moving around the galaxy at 250 kilometers per second or something like that, I've forgotten. So it's not quite an inertial frame, but it is good enough. And the radio astronomers are pretty careful people doing this thing. So the, so the one line answer to your question is, you get to know the positions of these pulsars with respect to the inertial frame, which is the barycenter of the solar system. If they are not moving, and then if they move, how much they move, and do they move periodically? And if periodically, what is that period? They think they have a signal now to say something. I have not, because see, I have no access to journals. I only know what I see in BBC, in my phone, or newspapers. Talk to the experts here. I don't know anything more. But the basic physics is something very simple. But physics is simple, but very involved technically. Like any measurement. There's all this thing I read in the paper. I didn't understand this big thing. Everywhere BBC, everywhere newspaper, Hindu, antimatter falls down like matter confirming. I thought there was no doubt antimatter should fall down. When I was a student, 55, 60 years ago, a person called Fairbanks in Stanford did the experiment, free-falling positron. He came to the conclusion positron fell <laughs> down. So I don't know what this fuss is all about. But I only know from this. But it's a talk, talk, talk to him, talk to a radio astronomer. Okay. 
I'll tell you the details. It's a very beautiful problem in physics, how to time pulsar. Yeah, any other? Yes? Let me first ask her. She's from, she gets priority. She's probably for college students, so she gets priority. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture, sir. I'm so grateful to attend, firstly. And then my doubt is, uh, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, this pulsar will be living forever, like it won't die. My doubt is, will there be any mass loss, mass loss in the neutron star? Like why how it, it is it possible? Why, why, would, why would, see, sun loses mass. Yeah. Sun loses mass because there is radiation generator at the center, and the radiation pressure produces the solar wind. The sun loses mass, but it is insignificant, OK? But more massive stars lose more mass, and it is uh, dramatic. But a neutron star or a white dwarf is a cold object. Okay. They are supported against gravity, mm -hmm. essentially by the pressure of electrons in one case and the pressure of neutrons in another case. Okay, sir. So there is no scope for it to lose mass, other than the following. Now, Dr. Bala Iyer studies this, two neutron stars coming very close to one another, finally merging and emitting gravitational waves. But imagine just before they merge, they are close enough that the gravitational pull of one neutron star or another produces huge tidal bulges, like our oceans bulge because of the moon. In that situation, a neutron star can lose significant amount of mass. Yeah. And people believe that it isn't such a mass loss that all the gold and platinum and europium in the universe is made. Mm -hmm. Till very recently, people didn't know how gold and platinum and all the heavy elements are made. They thought they were made in supernova explosion. They are certainly not made in the stars. You can't make anything heavier than iron in the star. Then they came up with a clever idea how you make it when the star explodes, when there are a lot of neutrons. That didn't work either. Okay. But what seems to work is mass loss from neutron star when two neutron, I mean, you have to bring in either a black hole or a neutron star near another neutron star to pull okay. something out because the gravity is so strong. Mm -hmm. I told you. One Mount Everest is falling on a neutron star every second mm -hmm. for 10 billion years. Yes. So you would think there should be huge mountains on neutron star. So if you do the physics properly, it turns out the maximum height of a mountain on a neutron star is only about 70 or 80 centimeters. OK, sir. Yeah. Ma maximum height of a mountain on the Earth is Mount Everest. Yes. Yeah. So if you, why? Do you know why? Not exactly, sir. Ah, it's not because you haven't found anything. What if when you're not looking, uh, whatever this, uh, there is a, uh, some flying god comes and picks up Kenshin Janga and puts it on top of Mount Everest, suddenly you have a mountain twice as tall as Mount Everest. Do you think it'll be there? Why not? I put a lot of heavy coal, stick it. No, Mount Everest will sink. Again, the net height of the new mountain will be the same, same as yeah. the present mountain. Because it has to do with solid state and structural properties of the crust of the Earth. Same in neutron star. Okay. So neutron star gravity is so strong mm. that you can't have a mountain very much bigger than this. So pulling some matter out will require help from another neutron star or a black hole. But today, we have such objects. So that is the exciting thing when the next generation LIGO type of detectors are able to trace the coalescence of neutron star all the way up to the coalescence, okay. yeah. then you will be able to see, hopefully, mm -hmm. the effect of mass loss from the neutron star. Yes, sir. Till Thank then, yeah. it is an interesting question. So. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, uh, one more uh, uh, doubt. The first exoplanet discovered was around the millisecond pulsar. So, uh, do you have... Like, what do you think is the connection between exoplanet and a millisecond well, well, Very pulsar? simple. Millise exoplanets are formed from leftover material mm -hmm. from 
the formation of the star. So a star forms, and then the resulting material, because of the rotation, forms a disk. It's a circumstellar disk. The disk is essentially a lot of dust and gas. Planets form out of that. Now, your low-mass X-ray binary, what is it? You have a neutron star, a millisec which will become a millisecond pulsar, and there is an accretion disk. What is an accretion disk? Gas and dust. Yes. Gas and dust. And where did the dust form? From the same reason the dust forms. Atoms form molecules, molecules form larger mm -hmm. molecules, and finally form dust grains. So you form planets from this leftover yeah. dust. So what better system than you can have than a millisecond pulsar with a low mass X-ray binary accretion disk which lasts for hundreds of millions of years? Because what calculations show now is if you take a normal star which has a disk, that disk lasts only for about a few million years. So you have to be very clever to form your planets in a very short time. Whereas in LMXB, you have all the time in the world. Yeah, yeah. So I am not at all surprised that they found the first uh, planet. Okay. But it is tragic that they were not given the Nobel Prize, just because uh, that is a neutron star and not a gaseous star. Yeah. OK, there, there, there's no, I know both those people who found it. Yeah. Uh, it's a solid discovery. I, again, that is from timing. How do they know yeah. the pulsar, I yeah. mean, planets are there? By timing this pulsar. Because the pulsar is now moving in the center of, around the center of mass mm -hmm. formed by the pulsar and the two planets. Yes. yes and there that is, um, tiny little yeah. motion that radio astronomers can detect. Yes, sir. And later they found one more also. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. Yeah. You have a question. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. I think you kind of answered some of the question I'm asking, but uh, again, uh, what's next for uh, pulsars and what exciting topics in astronomy are you looking forward to hearing of? Um, I told you I am, I am completely out of science. I don't follow. <coughs> I, I have limited time to read. And um, I only read about one subject, which is uh, evolution. I am no longer interested in astronomy or physics. Uh, in the, no, in a serious sense, because what does one mean by interest? You see, you, you read something, you ought to be able to talk about it to somebody. It, the excitement comes in to and fro communication. I don't live in that environment anymore. So I have gone back to what I used to do before, trying to learn new things. I am very bugged by something that uh, Darwin was very much bothered by. He wrote very clearly in his origin of species about the uh, evolution of our organs. He wrote very clearly one of the difficulties with the theory of evolution, such as the one he had constructed, he said it cannot explain the evolution of organs. Why did the eye develop like this? We are able to adjust from single photon to looking at the sun. Uh, and then finally, he said, no, it cannot be due to evolution. It must be due to adaptation. And I have great difficulties understanding that. So I spend my time trying to use Google. I, I cannot read scientific journals because they will be too technical for me. But uh, now and then, the, in, so, I don't, so I follow astronomy developments only in uh, BBC or some such forum. I am very much one of you next time I come. I would love somebody telling me, Beeman or somebody telling me, what is all this fuss I read, see in YouTube every day from morning till night, as though James Webb Telescope has proved everybody wrong. <laughs> from Copernicus till us, everybody is wrong, particularly Beeman, uh, working <laughs> in uh, galaxies and cosmology. Not so much pulsars. Uh, and I, I just don't know what, what all this fuss is about. Because sometimes this fuss is about much ado about Nothing, right? So maybe next time we can talk about it. So Very good. Yes. So thank you for an amazing lecture. Uh, again, since you did you did you understand anything? <laughs> <laughs> Little yeah, bit. Like uh, 
I like material science much. Like Doesn't lithium matter. liking material science much, but yeah. So I, lot of material. Yeah, there. yes, sir. super conductivity <laughs> when it comes. Yeah. Thank you. Do you know, me. you know the iron lattice. Seriously, the iron 56 lattice on the surface of the neutron star is not made up of iron atoms which look like billiard balls. They are like needles. Atoms are like needles. That is material science. I'll tell you why, just one second. It's a very interesting thing for you to think about. Atoms on the surface of the neutron star won't be like atoms here. A hydrogen atom here, electron orbits will be more or less circular. But not in a neutron star for the following reason. The neutron star surface, there is a strong magnetic field. So the electron has a problem. It has to satisfy two quantization conditions. One is Bohr, who says the angular momentum has to be nh. That gives you various orbits. The other is Landau. Landau said in a magnetic field, electronic motion is quantized. And there are lengths associated with it. So there are two lengths of the problem. Magnetic field will not matter in a direction along the magnetic field. But Bohr will matter. In perpendicular to the magnetic field, Bohr will not matter so much, but Landau will matter. And since the Landau radius is much smaller than the Bohr radius, atoms will look like needles. Now you may say, why is it of importance? That has to do with material science. If I have a lattice of needle-like atoms, then the forces between the atoms is tensorial. It is not scalar forces. So the mechanical strength of the lattices will be very different. So material science is involved even on the surface of a neutron star. Right. Yes, and please. Just, uh, out of curiosity, like you said, uh, your interest lies out of astronomy right now. Uh, I would like to ask anything uh, that has went mysterious or like so something out of your observations that this shouldn't have been like this, but why am I getting like this? And like you never continued to think about it or something like In that. In astronomy? Yes, sir, astronomy. Very much so. There are many, many yeah, things like anything that. Anything as of you would but, like to share. But you know, you can't, uh, this goes back to something I was talking about lunchtime. Um, very often I have a friend in Cambridge his name is Martin Rees. He's a very famous man, one of perhaps the world's most famous astronomer. He often sends me emails saying, what do you think of this? Some fast, fast radio burst or something, magnetor, something. I write to him saying, look, I know nothing because I have no information about any of these things. So I can, yes, there are a lot of things I wish I knew. But in order to pursue that, I must have access to journals, and more importantly, listening to talks, learning more than what newspapers will tell you. So I don't have that opportunity, so I don't make much progress. But uh, in this case, I was able to make progress because I was here, and we had friends with whom I could talk to. Okay. I didn't explain. Ask the talk to them. <laughs> yeah. I had slides, but I had already closed that file. But yeah, it's all right. So uh, you said uh, you predicted that there was uh, there will be approximately around ten thousands of uh, hundred thousands of milliseconds of that. Is there any mathematical basis to it, or oh, well, it's so elementary that you'll be embarrassed if I told you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, suppose you walk in the garden, ordinary garden and suddenly you found two nuggets of gold just in this small area, then you, have to, you must conclude that unless it came from someplace else, pull that out, then you must conclude that there must be a lot of gold. Otherwise, how do I find? Yeah. So when they found the third millisecond pulsar, all three millisecond pulsars were very close to us. And that is because of selection effects. Beaming and selection of sense sensitivity is selection effect. So if from, if from some so small volume of a galaxy, 
three are pointing towards us. There may be other five which are there but not pointing towards us. And that, but the galaxy is so big that simple scaling gave us hundreds of thousands. It's such an elementary argument. Yeah, uh, it is, but to get a ballpark number from it. Uh, it's, not, it's not very difficult because uh, radio astronomers will tell you from selection effects what is the maximum volume from which they can. See, the problem is this. If I send a, pulsars are not radiating at a single frequency. Yeah. They are radiating at all frequencies at the same time. Yes. But they don't arrive at the same time yes. because there is a plasma yes. in between in the interstellar medium. One frequency comes first. So a pulse, instead of being like this, at a, is a, is a, there is a collection of pulses. So instead of a pulse being like this, it is like this. So I cannot distinguish, I can distinguish this and this, but I cannot distinguish this and this. So millisecond pulsars are very liable for dispersion effects due to dispersion in the interstellar medium. So you can only find them from if they are nearby. That is an important selection effect. That selection effect becomes less and less reliable at higher and higher frequencies. But most of these radio astronomers are working at meter wave or lower frequencies where dispersion is very strong. So you can only find them in your backyard. So there must be a lot of them. OK. The second question is uh, related to the uh, philosophy of science that you shared. So most philosophy of, of science that you shared with yes. us, most of your discoveries or your predictions uh, were not recognized uh, in a sense in the uh, in the central stage of the world or scientific world. Do you, don't you think that is important in getting our science out there at this age of science? And do you think, and what can Indian scientists do better? I'll tell you what they can do. Yes. First, stop talking all this nonsense that our government is talking. We discovered everything 10,000 years ago. That nonsense has to stop, <laughs> OK? Yes. Second thing, a more serious note, even that is a very serious note. I'm sick and tired of uh, this nonsense that is being spoken. But more seriously, I wrote all papers in journal published in this campus because I decided I left the world's most famous lab where there were 29 Nobel Prizes and came here. I decided if I'm going to come here and work here, it must result in some improvement of our scientific environment. And publishing journals our own journals is an important part. Otherwise, others wouldn't publish journals. Now, the scene has changed significantly since that time. Visibility is very important. Where you publish at that time was very important. Today, it is not important. You can publish in current science, but then you have other archives and other notice boards where you post. It's immaterial where you publish. That is only for priority, but not in my time. Okay. So I don't think there was any racial prejudice or no such thing, absolutely nothing. It is just lack of visibility. In condensed matter physics, I had some visibility before I came. I switched to a new field. I taught myself by teaching students here. Nobody had heard of me. And I published here. Nobody told me to publish here. OK. And uh, that's all. The, the story simply ends okay. there. So I think. People should do. There's a lot of good work going on in India today. People should be talking about that instead of nonsense that happened 10,000 years ago or whatever it is. There's wonderful work going on in condensed matter physics, um, in biology in particular. Astronomy, a little less, because resources are limited. Because we have AstroSat, we have GMRT, and we will have soon time on 30 meter telescope and so on. So the scene in astronomy is changing very dramatically. And if people learn to build instruments, um, see the set standards here, building instruments for AstroSat. Paul Biswajit is building here. If we can build instruments, then we don't have to simply launch them in our satellites. Other people who are launching ambitious missions elsewhere in the world, you can say, look, I'm Aditya has a coronagraph. It's a very modest coronagraph built by essentially by an ISRO institution in Pinya. Now, they are very, very, very good, as good as any place in the world. Now, if astronomers can gang up with them, 
and for some next mission of NASA or ESA, saying, look, we'll build the instrument for you. You put it on uh, your satellite. So that is the way it goes. There are many young people in India in astrophysics who are pursuing this road. I, uh, Dr. Sita sitting behind you knows a lot of those people. I don't know many of them personally. There are a lot of them rising to this challenge. So I believe in the next 10, 15 years, they'll be absolutely challenging payloads, not just in Indian missions, but in NASA, ESA. Oh, one must go and be more aggressive. See, I belong to a different generation. Science was different then. But today it's different. You have to learn to swim in the, in the present tide. Visibility, improve your visibility. Yes. Thank, you, Thank you very much. Can you, I have to remove my pen drive, can somebody tell me? Thank you, Srini, once again, and hope to see you, looking forward well, to seeing you. Yes, I soon. hope so. Yeah. Can you tell me and how to remove this? And here is a oh my God, I didn't, uh, come in. thank you, thank you for all of Can you tell me how to remove my pen drive without damaging files, you usually have to click something. Please go ahead for the coffee. I'll get my pen drive and come. And then I have to leave. Yeah, he's closed it. Control is closed. So can I just remove it? I can exit. Yeah, now it is. Uh, yeah.